we can we can maybe start now. It's five minutes past the start, and there are fifty people. Yeah. That's pretty nice. <laughs> okay. Fire away! I'm very happy to answer anything. Yes. <laughs> Ask Andres so, anything. Uh, hopefully. So anyone, just raise your hand if it's if it's working. Hopefully it is working. I think I see a request to speak by Bijan. You can see. Can it. you see that, Ibor? Yeah, I can. Okay. I can. Okay, so I'm gonna invite to speak. Is it yes. working? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, Andres. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing this. This is, this is cool. Um, I wanted to ask how uh, how the progress on testing out the symmetry theory of valence is going, and uh, if there's any way uh, to get involved. Uh, yeah, how to support those kinds of efforts. I think it's like a, a really cool and important uh, facet of the research. Yeah, no, fantastic question. Uh, obviously very, very core to, yeah, the mission of QRI is to reverse engineer uh, valence, essentially mathematize it. So yeah, I could definitely say, say things about that. So essentially, um, you know, the kind of like one of the big projects in that area was essentially transforming um, near imaging data into the connectome specific harmonic wave decomposition, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, something that uh, people at QRI uh, worked really hard on, especially 2020, uh, 2021, um, and got really far. I mean, essentially, we have um, reproduced the methods of cell and atasoy uh, mm -hmm. to the point that, yeah, I mean, essentially, we can take in uh, tensor diffusion imaging as well as fMRI and provide us output essentially, yeah, the, the connectome specific harmonic wave decomposition. And essentially we are at the stage where we're essentially, yeah, trying to form uh, official collaborations with labs so that we can get essentially, yeah, the data required to, to test these theories. Um, we had for a little while data for uh, MDMA, but it, it turns out that the way in which they shared the data <laughs> was uh, outside uh, official channels, unfortunately, so we had to stop analyzing the data. Uh, so I, I would say, yeah, essentially the biggest bottleneck at this point is um, lab collaboration for like relevant data. Uh, and I, see. I mean, for for anybody listening, you know, if if you know like a of a lab, kind of like potentially willing to collaborate with a, an odd organization like like QRI, but you know, intellectually serious and technically technically, I would say, yeah, uh, pretty competent. It's um essentially the following characteristics. So data that um, examines very high valence states of consciousness. So, you know, top of our list are MDMA, 5-MeO-DMT, uh, actually like any like powerful euphoriant. I mean, like obviously if somebody is like studying, uh, you know, opioids or amphetamines even, uh, that also it's uh, of interest to us, but especially, you know, especially something like 5-MeO or uh, MDMA. And on the meditation front, um, essentially jhanas, but also um, people who can experience cessations, that also might be like really, really powerful way of testing this. Um, and uh, finally, we will be uh, hiring either later this year or early next year, essentially more technical talent. And I think like that will, yeah, essentially be a, a really powerful force multiplier and accelerator. Uh, you know, at QRI, we've definitely had like some pretty strong engineers and we're trying mm -hmm. to cultivate an engineering culture, essentially, uh, from the bottom up. And uh, yeah, I mean, essentially one of the, yeah, kind of a, how do I describe this? One of the, the yes, yeah, I guess soft constraints that I'm kind of uh, envisioning for how we want to construct QRI and, and actually grow it is, yeah, to, to ensure that we have a really strong engineering culture, essentially that, yeah, the majority of people who join, you know, can code at least a little bit, uh, can participate in code reviews, um, and that, you know, something like at least half of the people who are members, um, you know, people who are being paid or who are like active volunteers uh, are like engineers. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, right now we are, uh, yeah, at kind of like this like stage where the, the main bottleneck is actually data. <laughs> so gotcha. hopefully that answers your questions. Oh, I guess I should mention also that on the testing symmetry theory valence front, there's like also two more things to mention. Another one is um, uh, analyzing EEG data sets. And we did have like a pretty interesting pilot study there where we were analyzing the 
EEG of um, Daniel Ingram, who actually, you know, he did a lot of meditation on EEG on things like a fire casino. And, and we have uh-huh. the data and we have like some pretty interesting um, proofs of concept there. Uh, I can mention a little bit about this. So essentially, one of the kind of like technical challenges here is that when you experience a cessation, um, which is, yeah, okay, like a very high valence uh, moment of experience, and especially, you know, right after a cessation, there's like a period of something like 10 seconds where, yeah, people report they have extremely clear-headed, you know, amazingly bright, very beautiful consciousness. Um, there is one one little technical hurdle, which is that when the precise moment when you experience a cessation, you actually blink, and the blink is uh, involuntary, and is like pretty strong, which causes mm-hmm. an EEG artifact. Um, the way we <laughs> worked around this was essentially getting Daniel to, um, without meditating, but gathering EEG data to also blink, so that it, essentially we would have like, okay, like we have like 60 events where he's blinking, but not meditating or in any altered state, and something like 60 or 70 cessation moments where he is blinking and also experiencing this ex- extraordinary state of consciousness. And then essentially we were like averaging out what does like blinking look like <laughs> without meditating and then like subtracting the blinking mark uh, or the blinking pattern. Um, and once you did that, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess preliminary results, I, I wouldn't say this is like, uh, you know, written in stone or anything, but the, the thing that we were observing was, yeah, extremely high levels of uh, um, essentially, yeah, uh, coherence across all channels, uh, all frequency channels right after that. So essentially, yeah, basically all channels kind of synchronize. You can even see this visually, uh, uh, which, see. yeah, I mean, it's in line with a symmetry theory of valence or at least any theory of a structural theory of valence that essentially, you know, maps to something like degree of entropy of brain waves and valence. And at least in that data set, that seemed to be, yeah, there seemed to be a pretty strong connection. But again, that's just like one pr- practitioner, uh, Daniel Ingram right. in particular. But um, essentially, yeah, like gathering more data like that, uh, I think will allow us to make, yeah, a pretty interesting case on the EEG front. Um, the last thing I'll mention this is um, there's also like a paper on the works. We started uh, in 2020, in the 2020 internship cycle. Um and it was kind of a mess because we we enrolled kind of like five people to help with the paper, and actually that was definitely too many cooks. Um, and so you know it was kind of like this uh, sprawling paper. But no, I, I think at this point I've actually condensed it to a, a pretty manageable level, and I'm working with a um, yeah a really professional academic paper writer to essentially yeah get more more papers um, submitted to peer reviewed journals, um, and one of the the, the ones that we're going to submit is essentially, yeah, more formal account of the symmetry theory of valence. So that's also under works. That will ideally be the first paper that we publish in that space. And then um, right after that, essentially a paper <laughs> with a proper IRB approval for analyzing the data of, let's say, MDMA. And that, yeah, I think like would be hopefully uh, the first kind of like strong empirical uh, evidence base for uh, STV. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for answering my question. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Yeah, a question mark, I see. I'm going to... Uh... Ooh, my Discord question. legs. Like... Oh, no. Uh... I, can, I can invite him. Hello. Okay, I'm ju- uh, uh, you, you can invite him. Can you hear me okay, now? Hello. Set, this, this yes, set, yes. Set, hello. So, um, I have one question for you. Magnus Vending recently okay, wrote an article right called Why I Don't Prioritize Consciousness Research. Um, some of his um, arguments for things like um, consciousness research could potentially lead to um, deliberate harm. Um, and he thinks that consciousness research is less neglected than other causes and... Um, he argues that um, the what he calls the willingness problem, which is um, getting people to value reducing suffering, is simply more important. Um, would you consider reading it and responding to it at some point, and possibly having a discussion with Magnus Vending on should consciousness research be prioritized? 
Sure, sure, sure. I mean, this is a, <laughs> a tough question right here. No, yes. Yeah, so I, uh, is there somewhere I did... where I could post a link to it? Or... Uh, uh, lib Libor, uh, Bernie, do you know? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's like a place, yeah. Or, or you can choose it too. The, the one, uh, an article by uh, uh, um, Magnus Vending. Magnus, yes. Uh, um, I'm not exactly sure right now. You can probably post in just a channel. Yeah. We can just choose uh, a channel. Like, uh... I have one other question. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on S risks or um, risks of astronomical suffering? Um, do you think, well, um, do you have any ideas on how S risks could be averted? Yes. No, I, I have like um, a lot to say about, <laughs> about these topics. So, okay, first of all, uh, the, okay, so there's like several things that you um, touched upon. First is um, uh, potential misuse. Second one is willingness problem. And third is the more general question on S risks. Um, yeah, I mean, if you notice, uh, I very rarely talk about S risks, and that's actually quite deliberate. Uh, <laughs> and actually, there's like things that uh, I wouldn't necessarily talk about in public in this space. But I do think like addressing yeah the questions that you're um, uh, making is yeah very very important. So first of all, I do think it's put a potential uh, problem to be um, uh, kind of like misuse of consciousness technologies, but um, because I think like the the biggest problem when it comes to uh, willingness problem is essentially people don't necessarily have um, a sense of the actual um, essentially yeah I mean skin in the game is kind of like one uh, one impossible frame here um, essentially um, the vision that I'm presenting, if you look at uh, the future of consciousness presentation, which I'm going to make also a QRI article, is that what we need essentially is a positive feedback loop that essentially allows us to, yeah, create valence aware value alignment in a way that reinforces itself as, as, a, uh, as an entire system. And essentially that goes through three strategies, which is... Uh, reducing negative extreme, increasing baseline, and achieving new heights. Um, essentially, on the front of reducing negative extreme, uh, something that you will notice is that, you know, we're not, in a sense, developing a theory of extreme suffering. Rather, the only thing that we're doing there is identifying really effective, surprisingly useful pragmatic technologies. So for example, yeah, something like DMT for cluster headaches, it doesn't actually inform you exactly what a cluster headache is. It just, hey, like this actually gets rid of it for currently fairly mysterious reasons, but it's just like e extremely effective. Um, I do think that, I mean, essentially, yeah, the huge amount of current suffering is concentrated in states like that. And yeah, identifying like really simple pragmatic solutions that are not necessarily very illuminating about how these things work, but that they actually are effective is a key component of essentially creating this uh, feedback uh, loop. Um, why? Because when you rescue people from hell, so to speak, you have essentially, yeah, kind of you're creating a lot of uh, merit, you're creating a lot of uh, willingness, a lot of people who are, yeah, essentially going to be very grateful and very happy to contribute to uh, allow this to, to propagate uh, elsewhere as well. Um, that, I think it's a, a, a very important uh, component. Um, essentially, uh, the logarithmic scales of pleasure and pain, I consider them essentially, yeah, one of the most important ways of tackling the willingness problem in that, okay, if you just came down from, you know, a really transcendental, extremely high valence, uh, 5 mu DMT experience, um, yeah, essentially you have kind of this skin in the game, this uh, knowledge that there is this, yeah, essential potential for, for heaven. Um, and that is like, yeah, extremely motivating, essentially can allow you to connect to kind of like the super cluster that is trying to work on, on this project. Um, more so, um, one thing that consciousness research can do in this space, and I think, you know, this addresses both the willingness problem and po potential misuse, is some kind of formalization of what benevolence ultimately accounts to. Um, you know, at QRI, we will say that you know, the key ingredients for, for alignment. And I'm, I will probably touch upon this further uh, as more questions come in. But essentially, it's um, these two ingredients of first, 
uh, something functionally equivalent to open individualism, where you, okay, you identify with everybody's suffering, everybody's happiness, uh, and then also valence realism, that you actually take seriously that there is a objective quantity of, of suffering, of, of, of happiness on any given state of consciousness. So when you have those two ingredients, I think that's a, yeah, really kind of like a cure you know, for nihilism, for <laughs> for steep, typical solipsism, <laughs> um, and and essentially is like a form of yeah, generating I think like a really powerful value alignment. Something that it's not even possible given the philosophical background assumptions of you know a cluster like less wrong or rationalist more generally, or even in in effective altruism. So all of this is to say, um, I think that yeah, the sort of research that we do at QRI um, will address those points. Uh, in in this interesting way, which is that by generating uh, access to super pleasant states of consciousness, you're generating skin in the game. Also, this kind of research will allow us to formalize what benevolence is, which I think it's yeah a really critical component of any kind of uh, valence aware alignment. And ultimately, you know, I'm I'm in some sense like somewhat pessimistic about how like our current Darwinian dynamics is leading us. And so the ultimate vision of how do we create a benevolent, you know, co super cooperated cluster here involves something along the lines of understanding in what way something like an MDMA-like state of consciousness can actually be not only, you know, good for you in the moment, but also useful socially. So... It is definitely my observation. Um, I, you know, I, I used to work at a company where we used to do a lot of um, engagement surveys and performance review analyses. And, you know, by reading thousands of those, yeah, I came to the conclusion that essentially <laughs> something like eighty percent of uh, people's energies uh, at, you know, companies, organizations, and so on ends up being wasted on essentially, yeah, like internal politics and infighting and and things like this. And I mean, essentially. Uh, I think this doesn't happen in places where essentially people are cultivating loving kindness in a really, really strong way, or at least it happens to a much less ex less extent. And if uh, our research actually were to show that, you know, there's a way of generating in a sustainable fashion, MDMA-like states of consciousness um, is one way in which, okay, we're not going to be just like moralizing, like, hey, hey guys, we should all be better, you know, be good. We should be motivated by uh, good purposes, but is a way to basically embed really positive states of consciousness in a way that can essentially feed itself. Like if you can create a company of people who are in MDMA-like states of consciousness, um, I think it's not only going to be a very pleasant place to work at, but also is going to be potentially productive, you know, it's kind of like a paradigm shift in productivity, simply because people are not wasting time in, in internally fighting. Well, anyway, that's like, possibly a pretty pretty optimistic vision but i think like that's kind of um really like the the most realistic way of um yeah kind of like changing uh, changing the quote unquote degree of malevolence in in the world is is not to kind of like moralize or even just attack bad actors but it's actually creating a paradigm where benevolence actually really truly pays off um economically and personally and socially and I don't think there's anybody in the world really kind of thinking about this, working about this in this way. If, if you know, the kind of like neglectedness that uh, Magnus might be talking about, yeah, it's sort of, um, okay, there's a bunch of neuroscience labs in the world. There's a lot of philosophers. Uh, yes, but I don't think there's like actually anybody kind of like trying to integrate all of these pieces of the puzzle in a way that would actually generate, you know, a positive feedback loop of benevolence and yeah i mean i think that's uh that's worth trying so uh yeah i think um, yeah go ahead uh, did you have anything else or oh i think it, um, yeah i was just gonna uh finalize with a i think just like a, a comment um, on on uh, sorry go ahead yeah <laughs> um i had one other question yes um have you read the article you can't argue with a zombie by jaron lanier I don't think so. So, Jared Lanier argues that, so for people like Daniel Dennett, for instance, who deny the existence of consciousness, um, that, our, uh, that the ability to talk about consciousness is evidence that someone is conscious. Mm -hmm. Yet, we know that there are some individuals, like Daniel Dennett, who 
deny the existence of consciousness. Do you think the fact that these individuals exist may be evidence that some people, like Daniel Dennett, are not conscious? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think uh, it's a very fun argument, and it's very entertaining. And uh, <laughs> I think it's, you know, fun to think about. Uh, in practice, I don't think so. I mean, like, if anything, if, you know, if it turns out that, like, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> they can't actually recognize the referent of what we mean about, you know, qualia, uh, let's say, in their visual field, the blueness of blue. If all they can, you know, ever actually talk about is, like, no, 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 there's, like, frequencies of light out, out there, and they can't, you know, recognize that there's an internal world simulation. Generally speaking, I would think of that as, yeah, some kind of, like, lacking philosophical intelligence um, <laughs> rather than them, like, actually not having qualia. I mean, simply because I think, like, yeah, essentially states of consciousness are quite computationally indispensable uh, when it comes to, yeah, essentially the kind of life that a human organism lives. I think like the entire hardware uh, of the human nervous system is essentially predicated under the assumption that it's going to be generating states of consciousness and it's going to be using that as part of the information processing pipeline. And yeah, I mean, essentially disorders of consciousness tend to give rise to, you know, profound functional uh, dysfunction or, yeah, dysfunction in general. Uh, there's all sorts of kind of uh, phenomenal binding disorders and <laughs> all of them give rise to a lot of dysfunction. Um, so, yeah, I think chances are it's more something at the level of um, philosophical uh, intelligence or ability to have internal reference, introspection deficits, or um, metacontrarianism, right? Like signaling intelligence by kind of like saying that you're above kind of the folk psychology frameworks, or, sorry, contrarianism or something like that. And, you know, from that point of view, <laughs> QRI is very much a, a meta contrarian where we're actually not afraid of saying very obvious things, <laughs> kind of the, the emperor has no clothes sort of thing, uh, you know, without being rude or anything. But, but, but the point is that, yeah, there's like a bunch of obvious things that philosophers will actually not be very happy to admit or talk about simply because, yeah, if you don't say something that is counterintuitive, you can't signal that, you know, you're smart, that you're kind of like <laughs> looking beyond the surface. Um, and I think, yeah, that kind of a sociological explanation is much more plausible. I, I will add, though, that, you know, if, if, um, like, if we could rule out all of those explanations, and yes, it turns out that, okay, Daniel Dennett's brain seems to be using a different paradigm of computing or something like that, um, and probably is a zombie. I would actually consider that like evidence that we are in in some sort of simulation, and that like maybe there's only a percentage of humans that are actually are quilia quilia equipped, <laughs> and kind of like the the point of the simulation is is to find each other. In which case, yeah, probably <laughs> you guys being in this group is part of a part of the game. But uh, <laughs> but I find that unlikely. I think it's uh, much more plausible that yeah, sociological and philosophical confusion accounts for it. So um, hey, hey guys, real real quick, I'm sorry, question mark. I just want to interject really quick. There are way more people in this chat than we had anticipated. Um, and we don't have a, a huge amount of time. Um, and we didn't set any sort of rules for the, the amount of uh, questions or time limits. Um, so after your question mark, uh, if you guys could limit the amount of questions to one or two a person, um, that would be like highly appreciated. So we can make sure that everybody who has a question can unanswered uh well thank you andreas your responses were interesting so it looks like we have a lot of people with their hands up so feel free to move on to yeah. someone else okay next one Artemis. thank you so much question mark i'm sorry for interrupting you there are just way more people here than we had anticipated yeah i wanted to say this as well okay next one you hear me yes Hi, Andres. It's uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Artem. I only have one question for you. So you mentioned uh, people who experience cessation, and you also mentioned by the mayor of DMT. Uh, I experience cessation on an ongoing basis during, like, throughout my waking daily consciousness. And by the mayor of DMT, it doesn't really affect me anymore. I mean, it used to, but uh, even a very large uh, in inhalation dose of 5-MeO DMT only affected me very slightly for about a couple of minutes. 
I don't trip on it and uh, smaller doses, which uh, I, I took it in a uh, ritual setting. So uh, I, I know that it was a, a good one. So it affected everybody. And for me, it was, I, I didn't experience anything. So I'm, I think that I'm in a permanent state of cessation. And I was wondering if you would be interested in um, studying my brain or if I somehow could contribute to your study, because I'm very interested in uh, contributing to the scientific advancement of the uh, phenomenon of enlightenment. Yeah, thank you uh, for the wonderful question, uh, Artem. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I can definitely say something about that. Uh, I remember in, uh, uh, and yeah, I think like a video by Frank Yang. He was he was uh, describing that like after his big awakening, his day to day, moment to moment experience essentially felt something like a hybrid between the ninth jhana plus uh, fifth jhana <laughs> plus normal waking consciousness <laughs> or something like that. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, obviously incredibly intriguing. Um, and yeah, I mean, to, to give a direct answer, for sure, we are like in the lookout of, yeah, creating like um, a team of people to study uh, precisely with this kind of phenomenology. Um, but we don't need to, you know, wait until we have, you know, the funding and the people and, and the willingness to, you know, fly everybody to a location and do a lot of, you know, EEG and fMRI research, which, which I think we should, definitely should do. Um, but we can do a lot of progress in the meantime already on the phenomenology front. So, I mean, I think the really the most powerful way in which right now you could kind of contribute to, yeah, this, this uh, scientific endeavor and to QRI is uh, to things such as like commenting on the dialogue that I had with uh, Roger Thiesdale. Uh, you've pr have you read uh, the article on quality computing called the uh, the Supreme State of Consci Unconsciousness? Uh, did you read that one? No, probably. No, no, I haven't. No. I mean, oh, okay, that's okay. probably yeah. what it is, though. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, I mean, the amazing thing about um, uh, Roger Thiesdale, who's uh, this 26-year-old... Um, uh, yeah, meditator who has achieved apparently a fourth path um, is that he's incredibly lucid and very, very verbal in in his uh, in his um, cognitive style, and uh, as a consequence, it's actually very easy to um, talk with him and arrive at like very interesting, you know, novel, non-trivial observations about like what does it mean to be in fourth path. And he has this um, series of pictures that I highly, highly recommend uh, taking a look at where he describes the progression in his uh, transformation of consciousness over the years uh, after a lot of meditation and essentially visualizes in kind of this um, um, schematic way how attention and awareness changes as a function of where you are on the path. And essentially he finds that there are kind of these five very distinct uh, um, stages. The first one is normal everyday life where like you experience yourself as essentially being located inside your brain, kind of like this like standard everyday sense of self. Um, the second stage is where you essentially identify with a witness of consciousness. And for a lot of like spiritual teachers, actually, this is kind of the end. Like uh, it's like, oh, once you realize that you're the witness of consciousness, you're, you're kind of this flavorless, you know, um, thing that essentially is, is the same in everybody. I mean, it has kind of a little bit of an open individualist flavor. Um, for some people, that's kind of the end of it. But then there's like the, the next layer where he calls it kind of God mind or universal consciousness, where literally everything that you see and you experience, you just identify it with, uh, with yourself. And it's kind of, you're everybody, you're everything, you're every sensation, everything that ever was and ever will be. And then there's like, um, you know, the next stage, which is uh, the no self state, where essentially it's kind of the complete opposite, where absolutely nothing that you experience is labeled as yourself. So you're kind of outside in a sense. Uh, you're, none of the things that you experience is experienced as you. And then finally, the last one is uh, centerless consciousness, where he describes his experience as fully holographic without a center. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot to kind of like unpack there about like, why would that feel good? And I think the symmetry theory of aliens has quite a lot to offer there. But I think the way you can contribute the most like right now is to kind of like take a very close look at that uh, literature 
and then comment on it. Essentially describe like, is this how you experience the world? Can you make a diagram that, you know, maybe accounts for something that you experience that maybe Roger doesn't experience? Anything in that space. I think it's uh, how right now you can, <laughs> the biggest bang for the buck uh, is located. Okay, I see. Well, he's entirely correct. And uh, I went through all of these stages also, uh, and I described them very similarly. Uh, I am a spiritual teacher and I have a website, uh, true-freedom.net, where actually one of my questions, what are the stages of enlightenment, pretty much describes the same thing uh, in my own words, of course. So uh, so I have been writing about it for a while. Uh, I was uh, hoping that maybe some scientific uh, methods could be used to advance the understanding, but he's entirely correct, yes. That's cool. awesome. Yeah, I mean, the the... Yes. Uh, just the just last uh, thing here is, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the key thing I'll um, leave you with is to think about it in terms of valence uh, structuralism. Like, the way in which your experience has been reshaped might be, you know, generating better valence. And any kind of, like, comment in that space, I think, is, like, yeah, extremely valuable and nobody else is kind of thinking in that particular way. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for your question. You, you will. You have a good day. Okay, uh, now we can ask one which was from a person who couldn't come and I found that many people wanted to ask it. It's uh, it's one that's ba the first one in the questions text channel. Uh, I can read it for you if you want. Yeah. Okay, so the question, it's from Cornifer and she or he or they <laughs> said uh, you said that your solution to the binding problem is that consciousness or qualia comes from like topologies or electromagnetic fields or whatever created and exploited for computation by the neurons in our brains. And of course, it's obviously the case that modern AI research does stuff with highly abstracted neurons that don't generate inter interestingly, interestingly shaped electromagnetic fields just basically random fields on the GPUs. So obviously, if you buy the electromagnetic topological binding premise, it follows that modern AI stuff isn't on track to producing consciousness. But you said that you can't, can't produce simulated or computerized consciousness, that uploading is impossible, given your electromagnetic topological binding hypothesis. Not just that modern AI research isn't on track to produce it. But why wouldn't a simulated human brain body system with simulated electromagnetic fields that have simulated topologies and interact with its simulated neurons have consciousness? Shouldn't, shouldn't that sort of upload be possible? Unrelated also? Oh, okay, uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think a lot of people get kind of uh, stuck there. Um, and um, Yes, I mean, this, this is like really, really important. And actually, uh, you know, this is almost kind of a AP testing. I'm very curious, like, hey, like, is what I'm going to say actually clarifying or convincing anybody? <laughs> or am I, yeah, kind of like just uh, screaming at the void, so to speak? But no, I mean, he here's the, the, the answer to this. Well, to ref to, to just to reframe the question is like, okay, like if the thing that matters for consciousness um, it, the, the solution to the boundary problem is essentially, okay, like topological pockets in electromagnetic fields or something along those lines. Why can't we simulate the entire field, you know, or simulate a big portion of the electromagnetic field? And um, in that way, you're not simulating, you know, in a coarse level uh, description of a brain in terms of neurons. You're actually kind of like trying to, to go deeper and simulate, you know, the field behavior. Okay, like... This may actually be a way of generating a philosophical zombie or something quite approximate. It's not going to be a perfect philosophical zombie. And the way to realize this is um, to apply kind of this sort of reasoning to uh, quantum computing. So quantum computing can be uh, approximated by a classical computer. The problem, though, is twofold. First of all, you will have runtime complexity issues, which is that as you know, the, uh, the, uh, the number of qubits that you're entering to quantum coherence for your computation grows, um, you will require an exponential, uh, exponentially increasing amount of compute in order to simulate what is going on there. So essentially, 
I'm sure you can, you know, scale down uh, the speed of the, you know, the simpler computations, and uh, maybe put a lot of compute on like simulating the larger quantum coherent waves. And in that way, you can kind of uh, fake it and say, okay, this computer <laughs> is a, is a quantum computer, but it's you know a hundred times slower, and like the tasks do scale properly, but it's all really kind of a trick to account for the differences in runtime complexity. Um, yeah, something like that would be kind of, you know, a, imagine the equivalent of a philosophical zombie, but for a quantum computer. It's like, okay, this thing behaves like a quantum computer, but it actually isn't. Uh, maybe it's just a little bit slower, you know? Um, something like that. I think it's, it's possible. You can simulate the field um, to arbitrary levels of resolution. It's going to take forever. You will have runtime complexity issues, but ultimately, yes, you will be able to replicate the input output mapping um so but again like it's not going to be a perfect thing because there's going to be runtime complexity issues but the other thing that you're missing there is that you're not actually creating a bound uh physical state um you're simulating one and the reason why that that doesn't work is that um you simply don't have um the actual um uh you, you don't you don't meet the criteria that we set out so for example uh that will require some sort of a strong emergence uh to happen um weak downward causation is not actually being um is not actually computationally beneficial and since you're simulating or pretending that there's this weak downward causation because you're simulating it but then like the cost of that is an increasing runtime complexity that uh yeah you have to kind of uh work around and fake. And, you know, to kind of like get the, the full understanding here, you really need to expand your very conception of what computation is. And my claim is that, you know, if you've been <laughs> thinking a lot about computation in terms of, you know, computational equivalence classes, in terms of uh, how everything can be reduced to a Turing machine, or you can find a computational equivalent, you know, Turing machine version of, of computation, is that you kind of like have this implicit mental rep representation of what computation is to begin with, which is constraining, where, you know, your internal representation of it is very schematic, where you have kind of these series of ones and zeros as input, you have some, yeah, digital process that's going on in between, and you have a series of ones and zeros as output. But if reality can actually afford, you know, balanced states that are like larger than just, you know, a bit of information, um, and you're using them for computation. You know, that's kind of a generalization of a computer where like you don't only have ones and zeros to work with, you also have these bound states to work with. And yes, ultimately you can create a zombie, an approximation that will, you know, match the input to output, but it's not going to match the internal bound states in between. And I guess uh, I'll leave you with um, yeah, kind of this observation that bound states could also be not only parts of the internal information processing pipeline. They could also be uh, the format in which you give the input or the format in which the computer um, outputs. Uh, in other words, you know, this generalized, you know, um, enriched conception of computation also allows you to think of um, that the input to the computer might be, for example, <laughs> uh, a particular configuration of superfluid helium. <laughs> and that for sure, you know, you cannot actually input into a digital computer because yeah, the format is, is uh, simply wrong. And yeah, I mean, likewise, um, if you were to yeah, simulate the fields, again, with runtime complexity issues, you might generate a zombie, but you're just simply going to lack the internal bounce states. Sounds good. Uh, next one we can, for example, Nick M. I'm gonna invite him to speak. Yeah. Sounds good. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wicked. Um, it's a pleasure to kind of meet you online. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say before, I asked a question in the question thing earlier, uh, like my question, because I wasn't sure if I could make it. But so yeah, if you see that later, later you can just ignore it. Um, so I wanted to ask you about time uh, and specifically about kind of the metaphysical relation of time to mind. So Kant says uh, Kant's argument for the ideality of time or for thinking that it's like a mental primitive 
is just to say, imagine nothing, what's left, there's a black void, and time is still passing. And so the black void is evidence that you can't uh, imagine space away, and the fact that time is still passing uh, phenomenally is evidence that you can't imagine time away. And so he concludes from that that since every sensible quality can be imagined away, time must not be a sensed quality but must be a mental quality or a mental primitive. And um, I haven't gotten a chance to read the, your uh, blog post, the pseudo time arrow, in any great detail yet, but I wanted to know um, what you think of that argument and maybe what you th do you think that time uh, is real and is a mental primitive or does it exist out there in the world or does it exist at all and maybe it's just an emergent phenomenon? As Jen was saying in the chat earlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, a wonderful question. Um, I mean, I think I think uh, the article probably will <laughs> answer it. Um, but I can, yeah, provide like a little bit of insight. And, and also, I'll say something new that's not in the article for those who have already read it. But essentially, yes, um, the problem with that kind of argument by Kant is that you know he's arguing from the, what is conceivable given his state of consciousness. <laughs> um, he, you know, Kant didn't explore LSD <laughs> or salvia, <laughs> you know, and it's fairly common or somewhat common for people to, to take salvia and then say, oh my gosh, like time actually stopped. And it was like this moment of eternity. I don't know why I'm here because <laughs> that's actually still there in some very strange way. Um, so, I mean, essentially having, a, you know, actual experiential access to moments of eternity where actually time stops, you experience this thing that is actually kind of a geometric layout and it feels like nothing is happening. Um, I've had that happen <laughs> multiple times on myself and it can actually be extremely euphoric if you're a really good uh, headspace and in general, because of the symmetry theory of valence moments of eternity will have kind of a valence artifacts uh, because of the enhanced symmetry in those states. Um, but they can also be really, really unpleasant if you end up in kind of a, a dissonant moment of eternity. So that's also something to be a, to be to be aware of. But yeah, I mean to to um, to sort of uh, uh, say it pretty directly. I think like Kant probably had like a impoverished uh, experiential set or evidential set relative to yeah what's available nowadays. Uh, if you're a psychonaut or or a meditator, um, does uh, time exist? I mean, I think like. Yeah, it's very important to distinguish between phenomenal time and physical time. I think like physical time uh, can be explained in terms of, yeah, something like the, the time arrow, um, the direction along which entropy is increasing. Um, metaphysically, I do ascribe quite a bit of a credence to eternalism that, okay, like really objectively, every moment of experience is already what it is. Um, Kind of a disconcerting view, but I think it's philosophically defensible. Um, in which case, yeah, our experience of time is, you know, massively misrepresenting actually what is going on out there. That we have this sensation of of movement and and happening, but it's is actually misrepresenting the physical world, and it's really just a, a property of the state of consciousness. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, a, one of the reasons I'm actually personally not, you know. Um, <laughs> disturbed by eternalism is that, yeah, I mean, essentially when you're disturbed by eternalism, you're actually kind of using your zero time arrow, you're representing what you would imagine to be an unpleasant kind of a physical time. Uh, but ultimately it's a projection, right? Like it has nothing to do with its intrinsic nature. I mean, like the yeah, physical time would be kind of a, an aspect of the noumena here in this case in uh, Kant's terminology. Um, but yeah, it's it's goes so much beyond like moments of eternity. I mean, both from personal experience and talking to, to a lot of uh, rational psychonauts, um, really it's not only, you know, moments of eternity, you also have time loops, you have time reversal. Uh, if you play with um, uh, Adobe Audition or uh, Ableton Live and things like that, there's like this uh, reverse reverb where like you invert the, um, you invert the sound and then you apply reverb to that and then you revert again. And so you get kind of this phantasmagoric <laughs> weird time effect where reverb is uh, kind of in the opposite direction that it should be and it sounds really trippy. Yeah, you can also experience a pseudo time arrow that's kind of like that. 
Um, you can experience time branching. You can experience um, two arrows of time that are orthogonal to each other. Um, well, I would claim you can do that on, on DMT. Uh, there was this recent article about, yeah, essentially there's uh, uh, some uh, physical configurations that seem to exhibit like two independent arrows of time. Yeah, that's uh, kind of suggestive of DMT, honestly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, anyway, I think this is an extremely rich topic and we just need, yeah, essentially more rational psychonauts, physicists to, yeah, try things like DMT, have moments of eternity and, and uh, ex essentially, yeah, describe that in, in more for formal terms. All right, thank you. Do you mind if I very quickly paraphrase what you said, like extremely fast to see if I understand? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so basically Kant is uh, overgeneralizing his experience of imagining nothing, uh, of that time arrow that exists there or occurs there. He's overgeneralizing that, uh, assuming that it applies to all experiences when it just doesn't. Um, and physical time can be described in terms of arrows, but phenomenal time does not necessarily correspond to those arrows. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That the There's not a clear clean mapping between the actual um, arrow of time in physics and the structure of the pseudo time arrow, which is why, yeah, you can experience things such as like time inversion, where like subjectively entropy is actually decreasing. <laughs> very, very trippy effects. But yeah, essentially you need to uh, enrich your conception of phenomenal time because there's a lot of crazy, crazy stuff out there. I never tried psychedelics, but I took four times the dose of Gravol accidentally and had this kind of orthogonal time experience. So, uh, yeah, that was wild. But, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. So, next one, random Alber Alberos. I forgot how to pronounce your name. <laughs> I invited him. Okay, again, invite to speak. Can I just move him to podium? Do you see it? In a way to speak again. Uh, I don't. Who's? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I don't know if. Okay, let's uh, then, for example, the deep time tender. Okay, we we can make a random afterwards. Okay, deep do, do, tender. Do do can, do you see it? <laughs> Hopefully it's something right isn't wrong here. <laughs> deep time tenor. Are you there? All right, gonna, Nos, okay. are you there? Right, Nos. Oh, oh wait. Oh, okay. So I think I got it. <laughs> I'm gonna move you, Nos. Yes. Okay, cool. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, Andres, uh, I wanted to ask specifically about what your thoughts are on, um, like, transmission in spiritual traditions. So, um, I kind of affiliate pretty heavily with Dzogchen. And one of the sort of classic Dzogchen experiences is sort of offering yourself to a master and receiving a transmission. I know it's sort of a, a phenomenon that happens in other spiritual traditions as well. And there are similar analogs, you know, in, in psychedelic states or um, in deep meditation, kind of in channeling. This sort of like, I would almost describe it as like taking on another consciousness or like another parameter space and then allowing your own sense of awareness to sort of fill that uh, kind of new, um, I guess, epistemic uh, terrain. Um, I'm just sort of curious if you've thought about transmission and uh, and sort of what your your um, current ideas are on it. Uh, totally, totally. So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, um, I, I take very seriously, you know, rigorous uh, phenomenology, and there's definitely quite a bit of phenomenology of yeah things such as uh, transmission. Um, and yeah, I mean, Daniel Ingram is really open about some of the yeah more crazy, hard to explain stuff that has happened to him. Uh, the first thing that I will say is that um, essentially, you remember like uh, valence structuralism and quelia formalism, like, okay, like for any moment of experience, for any given physical system that generates a moment of experience, you hypothesize there's a mathematical object such that the mathematical features of that object are isomorphic to the phenomenology. You know, that kind of a, is a frame that you might think only applies to uh, physicalism. But I would claim that, you know, even if, you know, the spirit worlds uh, are out there, even if DMT actually gives you access to, you know, other, other dimensions and maybe the physics that we know are, you know, just like a special case in the multiverse that can be accessed with, uh, you know, other levels of consciousness or something like that. 
I would then, you know, make the 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 kind of like move to say, uh, well, there's probably spiritual structuralism here. <laughs> In other words, that there's probably mathematics that explains the spirit world if if it exists. Um, so I think like the case of something like transmission, you know, if it turns out that we, you know, we can't explain it just in terms of, you know, entrainment via, uh, you know, uh, body language or, or a uh, tone of vo voice or uh, even just like because you're being hanging out with the other person quite a lot or you have, well, there's like a lot of ways in which, you know, this could be a, a purely internal phenomenon. Um, you're just projecting the impression that, you know, there's this transmission. Okay, if that doesn't turn out to be the case and that you can, you know, objectively, objectively show something like, you know, you separate the participants um, and you have them have EEG in different rooms and then you have like this in incredible level of spontaneous synchronization of, you know, chaotic patterns and, you know, it's not only that the synchronization happens with a very simple brainwave, but it's actually, a, you know, a complex chaotic pattern that appears simultaneously in both brains and you, you can show that this couldn't possibly happen by chance or something like that. You know, my, my perspective then is like, okay, awesome. Then let's explore this phenomenon in, you know, the most rigorous mathematical the way that we can and derive the, the physics uh, of the spirit world. And this would be actually, I think, like quite amazing because I think you could apply, you know, frameworks from electrical engineering to the spirit world. We're like, okay, if... <laughs> whether it's a DMT entity or a master that you surrender to um, is actually in training your nervous system from afar. And there's no physical field that seems to, you know, be carrying this entrainment. Uh, you may be able to estimate, for example, what is the impedance matching between both nervous systems and, and quantify that, you know, quantitatively. And from that, infer things such as, okay, what are the properties of the medium of wave propagation <laughs> that is going on. And maybe you'll be potentially might be able to show that, you know, it has a different wave function <laughs> than any other physical field or something like that. Uh, so in that sense, I'm a epistemological optimist. You know, even if these things turn out to be extremely mysterious, I think we can still apply, yeah, kind of like a frameworks inspired by physics and computation to arrive at like, yeah, potentially a really good mathematical account of what's going on here. I will add that um, if the you know topological solution to the boundary problem actually pans out, um, that may I think like actually open up to a lot of weird effects. I mean, I, I assign like relatively low probability to this, but I think you know I don't discard it in any way. Which is that um, you know topology is a really powerful way of storing information in a way that is. Uh, robust against a lot of transformations. Um, so there's like, yeah, some recent research on how like some, in some cases, a photon actually creates a topological knot in, in the electric and magnetic field. And in, in, the, in that way, you know, the photon will survive for as long as that topology remains, which actually means that it will continue to exist uh, as long as it doesn't encounter a region of the, of the field that has divergence, a positive or negative divergence. If it's in a region of the field that has zero divergence, the topology will you know, continue to exist no matter what, no matter how you stretch it or you deform it, whatever, you know, it's still going to be a knot. Likewise, you can imagine that, okay, if you have like a really intense emotional connection with somebody, uh, you have a, you know, an intense annealing that happens when you're, when you're somebody, um, you might be potentially be doing something to the topology of the electromagnetic field in a way that is essentially like entangling you with the other topological bundle, not in a quantum sense, it's not quantum entanglement, but it would be, let's say, a topological entanglement in the electromagnetic field. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of reports of people, you know, describing that they were able to notice the precise moment when a family member passed away, you know, like if your dad or mom dies or grandmother or, or something like that in another country. And then, you know, you have this very powerful sensation that something very dreadful happened in your family or somebody went to heaven. Um, you take down like the time and it turns out that it, it is the case. And there's like a lot of reports like this. Of course, there's potentially many ways of explaining it that way. But if, you know, if this is actually a signal, you know, 
it might be something to do with the topology of the electromagnetic field. Again, you know, super speculative. The, the last thing I'll mention is that um, the, to the topological account of the boundary problem also would essentially open up different ways in which you can be connected with somebody else. So um, with the metaphor being with a soap of bubbles, well, a soap bubble, well, ima imagine kind of this as soap matrix or a soap bubble cluster, you know, kind of a, you open a <laughs> seltzer water and like it, it over floods and you have all of these bubbles. Well, two bubbles that are not adjacent, um, you know, are not directly connected. You know, they, they need an intermediary um, uh, medium, you know, other bubbles in order to transmit information and energy or uh, synchronize or something like that. But uh, they can actually be connected in multiple ways, right? Like uh, two soap bubbles may share a single point or they may share a line or they may share an entire surface, an entire face. Or, you know, that face may actually uh, be broken and then they could actually merge. And so, you know, when it comes to like, you know, crazy accounts of mind melding on LSD or with uh, your guru, you know, there may be like grades of these. It's like, okay, there's one kind of weak form of mind melding where the topology is actually connecting you with the other person, but just at one point. <laughs> so you have like just a one or zero dimensional point where like, you know, energy or impedance matching can happen. Or maybe you can connect through a line or an entire surface, or depending on the actual dimensionality of these fields, maybe you can connect, you know, on a hypersurface. So the degree of connection uh, may not only be, it may not only be like a matter of degree, but also may have like qualitative uh, different characters depending on the dimensionality of the interface between you and the other person. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I think if this is true, you know, again, like I think we might be able to actually measure this um, and, you know, visualize the topology of the field as the, the master is uh, send you a, sending you a transmission and yeah, quantify how much energy is actually happening, uh, is actually being transmitted. So anyway, very speculative, but it's just all that to say that I wouldn't give up, you know, if it turns out that <laughs> the spirit world is real and all these things are actually the case. It would just be a matter of uh, figuring out what is the physics and the maths of, of, of those extra spaces. Cool. Yeah, that was that was a really cool explanation. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's... Thank you. I have one more question, but I don't want to ask it if it will impede too much. Uh, uh, let's let's move on. Just to... Yeah. Okay. Thank you, though. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, okay. So, Amblex, if you're here, you can unmute yourself. Can I ask a good question? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I, I actually have a few, uh, if that's okay. Um, first, I wanted to add, though, that uh, I, actually when you uh, connect sort of the the centers of bubbles that are connecting, um, that are adjacent when you have sort of a matrix of, uh, or lattice of bubbles uh, that are all the same size, you get exactly what you're looking at on the screen right now, which is an octet truss. Um, nice, yes. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, the first question I, I had was sort of about uh, ethics. I, I was curious about uh, how some of uh, Qualia Research Institute's work um, may be connected to and integrated with in the future, uh, the work of uh, Brian Tomasic of uh, the uh, effective altruism. Um, I believe he's working on sort of, sort of like fundamental research questions uh, regarding sort of the uh, the consciousness of of different animals. Um, so I was curious to know um, to what degree uh, some of the research of uh, the Qualia Research Institute uh, can be applied to uh, animal consciousness, uh, whether to show whether animals sort of themselves do have consciousness, uh, as as some do not agree, um, and also to to see how their uh, relative uh, valences um, of, of their experience sort of uh, uh, measure up to each other, uh, so that uh, if we were to do something like a uh, uh, a suffering reduction program, uh, like advocated by David Pierce, then we would sort of know where to begin. For example, yeah. like if whales uh, um, turn out to be able to be capable of much higher or or lower uh, valence experiences than we are. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like one of the original motivations of trying to formalize valence is so that, yeah, we can have a theory that we can point at 
arbitrary um, sentient beings. I mean, ideally, you know, the theory is actually at the level of physics, you know, grounding consciousness in physics to the point that you can point that theory at arbitrary things, including, you know, something like a quasar <laughs> or a black hole, you know, a neutron star and things like that. But uh, no, I mean, I think like much more proximal is going to be non-human animals. And I, I am very optimistic here. I, I do suspect that essentially different animals recruit different valence gradients. Um, I find it quite plausible that there are species that because of the way in which they evolved um, and maybe the kind of social signaling that goes on in them may have like a super high hedonic baseline. Other species may have like a pretty bad hedonic baseline to begin with. Um, I'm sure that valence has been recruited for all, yeah, all kinds of uh, different purposes um, in, in the animal kingdom. And knowing that, I think it's going to be really, really crucial. I mean, it may turn out to be, you know, we may be surprised and it, it, it turns out to be that uh, dung beetles are actually the, the biggest source of happiness in the world by, by far, because they're like super, super consonant uh, topological pockets or something like that. Um, I would say that um, uh, I'm not, yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I don't know how, how to uh, say these kindly, but like, okay, like Mike Johnson wrote this article called uh, Against Functionalism which was kind of a criti critiquing the theory uh, that the Foundational Research Institute was using for approaching consciousness. Um, we joke, and okay, like maybe this is a, a little bit of a mean joke. I, I, don't, I don't mean it in a, you know, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but it's, <laughs> um, we, we joke a little bit that uh, the Foundational Research Institute, um, you know, concluded that because consciousness cannot be formalized and it's fuzzy, there's actually no foundational questions to be <laughs> to be solved, and uh, and in in some sense, kind of like uh, giving up on it, and you know, all a lot of the advocacy seems to have ended up being on the front of like you know, publicizing ideas such as like eliminativism or illusionism, um, or the absence of any objective grounding. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, you can find articles written from that time about. Um, skepticism that happiness uh, can be quantified or that there's like, you know, anything like a, an actual ground truth to, you know, how pleasant or unpleasant an experience is. All of that, of course, is kind of a mind boggling to some extent, because then you wonder like, well, if the suffering is actually nothing in particular, there's no real thing that is suffering is just kind of this fuzzy abstraction, like, why do we care about it? And if you ask Brian Tomasic about it, you know, he, he actually is very open about it. He says, like, yeah, there's no deeper reason other than I want it, <laughs> that, that I don't like suffering. And, you know, my own negative reinforcement algorithm is moving in that direction. And that, that's just what I'm doing. You know, there's no deeper ethical justification other than, yeah, that's like the response that I have. Whereas, no, I mean, from the point of view of a QRI, in some sense, like ethics is something that we can, yeah, I think like ultimately naturalize and discover in, in the physical world and truly kind of like quantify at the deepest levels. Um, I, I also think that it is, it is quite likely that um, we might find surprises. Uh, for example, it does turn out that uh, cats uh, actually experience cluster headaches. And that's something that I, I learned only recently. And, uh, you know, they, they, it show like, they look like they're not having a good time, but you have usually no idea just how bad of an experience they're actually having. And yeah, it may turn out that in the animal kingdom, there are species-specific intense suffering disorders, in which case, yeah, that would actually become kind of a, a priority uh, from an ethical standpoint. Um, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your, your question. Yes. Uh, so I, I was also curious if, to see if I could ask. Um, so... You mentioned that you think uh, sort of field behaviors uh, through uh, topological pinch, pinch, uh, pinch points um, is a, a good way to approach solving the, the uh, phenomenal binding problem. Uh, I'm still a little uncertain on exactly what the phenomenal binding problem is, to be perfectly honest. But <laughs> I was curious to know um, what, uh, whether it might be possible for there to be virtual field behaviors um, in a similar way that you can have sort of virtual dimensions that uh, aren't don't necessarily exist as dimensions as additional dimensions per se, but sort of behave with many of the characteristics um, sort of functionally as if they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this connects to what I was uh, explaining earlier, which is that, yeah, you can simulate field behavior. I mean, yeah, yeah, in that sense, yeah, you can absolutely have kind of a virtual field behavior that wouldn't actually generate uh, binding. Uh, it wouldn't actually generate phenomenal binding. It, it would be like functionally bound, again, with uh, runtime complexity ask, issues, but yeah. How do, how do you know that it wouldn't produce phenomenal binding? Uh, well, for the reasons I've explained in the article, essentially, um, it would be a sort of a strong emergence. It wouldn't have the appropriate weak downward causation that would ex essentially explain like why epiphenomenalism is is not the case. So, I mean, essentially, like the the argument I've presented in these articles, especially yeah, the recent one about uh, digital sentience, um, is yeah. I mean, if you want to have a successful theory of consciousness, it needs to satisfy a bunch of constraints. And, you know, some of those constraints are like explaining why consciousness exists to begin with, what its causal effects are, why natural selection recruited it, uh, how it solves the binding problem, and what is the set of qualia and qualia varieties and their interrelationships. And in some sense, I think if you're not trying to tackle all of those questions, it's sort of like trying to go to space, only caring about, for example, what is the escape velocity without also taking into account that, hey, space... <laughs> actually doesn't have any air <laughs> or that you will need fuel to actually uh you know jump from the moon back into the into into earth and things like that so what i'm saying is that the the actual you know the philosophical problem that arises from consciousness the heart problem is essentially much more detailed than you know just solving how you get consciousness out of like form and structure you also have yeah all of these like sub problems like what is qualia space and why does qualia space look the way it is um, and I think my solution to the boundary problem essentially can satisfy many of these constraints that virtual fields actually wouldn't satisfy. And, you know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but I would recommend yet yeah, to read that article very carefully. And um, also the abstract that I, uh, I referenced in that article uh, that I submitted to the Science of Consciousness Conference, um, where, yeah, I essentially lay out all of the constraints that you need to satisfy and then explain why uh, the topological solution can satisfy, satisfy those constraints. I'm sorry, in that case, then for, for uh, asking you to repeat yourself, uh, I suppose I need to do some more reading to, to really understand it a little better. Um, okay, so um, the last question, and I That's promise it's the last one, um, although I do have like a, a Google Doc with a bunch of other questions, but the, the last one here uh, is, uh, how much of an info hazard is, um, is knowing how to sort of uh, uh, narrowly anneal someone else? I mean, it seems like it could be potentially uh, open uh, to uh, a great deal of misuse, so I'm curious how, how we should act to sort of prevent that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, the, I mean, this is kind of uh, related to the, um, yeah, other info hazards. But I mean, essentially, like, there's no shortage of, you know, <laughs> people. Well, there's no shortage of like misuse in some sense, um, which is why I think actually a deeper understanding doesn't actually change it that much. Um, the thing to realize is that a deeper understanding of neural annealing would actually be protective in that you can find ways to essentially not allow yourself to be brainwashed. I mean, I think like that's one of the key things that already essentially, you know, cults and organizations and culture, they're already using neural annealing uh, in order to brainwash you in different ways. And I think, yeah, you know, it's kind of like the security mindset, hacker aesthetic, that if, if you know how this is happening, actually you can shield yourself against it. And I think one of, yeah, the, early kind of like promising things that is going to be very helpful to create is actually going to help you de-anneal uh, things that you have, uh, you know, unwittingly annealed to or things that you have annealed to without necessarily your full consent or, you know, the full, uh, all of your sub-agents agreeing to it. Um, and the other kind of like a very helpful aesthetic here is, uh, well, this is, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just mention this. So essentially there's a three elements uh, I don't think I've written about this, but I may have talked about this on, on a video. But essentially, there's uh, three core elements of our aesthetic that I think are like very protective here. So first of all is um, kind of this focus on 
benevolence from like kind of a loving kindness point of view, um, caring about all sentient beings. Um, but then also kind of this aesthetic of not exactly preserving human nature because that's a very loaded terminology, but more uh, essentially preserving the normal uh, self-organizing principles that essentially give rise to uh, human psychology and not doing like really extreme things that essentially substitute for those things. Um, this is like an aesthetic that Mike Johnson talks about as a uh, light touch interventions that essentially we are ideally helping the human organism um, essentially do things that it can't do for thermodynamical reasons or it can't do for um, practical reasons, uh, but they're like actually furthering kind of like the normal uh, human attractors in just like a more healthy way. So it's kind of like reconnecting with who you are. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention is that um, annealing, you know, as it is used in, in cults and so on, essentially is like a special case of it, which is like when you anneal together with particular intentional content, uh, essentially it's like, okay, you had anneal with your guru or something like that, or you, you know, the whatever it may be. Um, but that's not a, actually the sort of technology, you know, we, we would be interested in at all. The, the actual kind of technology we are much more interested in is annealing with uh, semantically neutral energy. So it actually doesn't influence your beliefs in any way or like not in any um, directed way, let's say. Uh, but it can clean the gunk of your nervous system. Um, and I think like, yeah, that's just beneficial across the board, independent of like, yeah, what else you you might believe. But yeah, to wrap up, the the, the number one kind of uh, reason I, I do consider this beneficial knowledge is that it will allow you to actually not be brainwashed by others because you know actually how that's working. Okay. Okay. I think that you tend to find that the, the hacker culture does not exactly make things more secure. Um, at least it hasn't uh, historically. Yeah. No. It's a, yeah. Definitely a longer conversation. But um, uh, I'm gonna leave. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Randall. Well, let's, in, let's invite Nos. Hopefully he will come now. Yes. Hey. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I have a, a couple of different questions. You can choose. Uh, would you rather answer about the ontology of qualia or about the ontology of reward? Ontology of qualia or reward? Yeah. Uh, both sound great. Which one <laughs> do you want to ask? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll ask both. You can combine it. <laughs> okay. So the first one is uh, just about the ontology of qualia. Um, so uh, what, what do you uh, think about, uh, what is the medium within which mental phenomena and constructs are, I guess, this isn't the best word, but presented? What is the medium in which mental constructs and what? Sorry, my... Phenome uh, mental phenomena are presented, like qualia. Yeah. Where are I mean, qualia presented? I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I mean, one of the kind of like big insights of Stephen Lehar is that, yeah, I mean, essentially computation is happening in an explicit spatial medium where waves propagate. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of what's going on in terms of the, yeah, the computation of your consciousness have to do with modulating the wave propagation dynamics inside that medium. Um, that medium, I mean, I think ultimately will be the electromagnetic field, but its properties are being modulated by essentially, yeah, what kind of, uh, yeah, what kind of uh, waves can propagate in the nervous system, both in terms of, you know, statistical level acti activity for neurons, uh, but also, yeah, the patterns of the local field potentials and how the, so they're organized. Yeah. Would the dimensions within which the uh, waves are waving, I guess, uh, be the qualitative dimensions, like uh, hue, intensity, uh, brightness, that kind of stuff? Or would it be some kind of different uh, uh, dimension that's not relevant to the actual qualia? Itself. Um, I guess I'm struggling to understand. There, there is definitely a, a big difference between phenomenal space and then the actual qualia that is painting that phenomenal space. I'm not sure which of the two are you referring to. So uh, I guess within the phenomenal space, uh, what constrains what's possible in the phenomenal space? Like in our, in our, uh, I guess, in some kind of space, you might be able to draw, um, you know, like uh, darker and lighter 
shades, but no color, for example. But some spaces you might uh, have uh, an extra three internal dimensions that allow for RGB, right? So uh, would there be something like that uh, that allows for like these internal dimensions uh, that contain certain values uh, in this phenomenal space, or would it be like a different structure altogether? That you, what do you think? Hmm. So, I mean, I, I think like um, you know, from near near physiological evidence, it does seem to be that we have like really specialized neurons, and you know, like David Pierce hypothesizes that the actual source of yeah, this kind of like low level paint qualia, so to speak, like colors in the visual field, um, you know, it's, it's actually originating from the protein structures inside the neurons, you know, depending on what is the gene expression inside the neurons in particular parts of the brain. If you, you know, damage the parts of your brain that are responsible for phenomenal color, it doesn't matter, you know, how you're going to rewire your brain as long as you don't have that particular gene expression, you may potentially lose phenomenal color forever. And I mean, there's like a lot of reports of people, yeah, essentially becoming colorblind, not because of damage to their eyes, but because, yeah, they have damage in that very particular part of the brain. Um, so now, of course, like that qualia is being, in a sense, kind of like routed, so to speak, or is, you know, entering a bit of resonance and local binding with other particular regions of the visual field. And in that sense, yeah, kind of modulating the qualia there. Um, I think like when you open up essentially like many more binding connections, as for example, in a psychedelic, uh, you can really generalize what phenomenal space uh, even is. So a, a very key component here is yeah, the concept of uh, virtual dimensions. Um, the video to watch is uh, are higher dimensions real, but essentially with uh, patterns of resonance, you can instantiate something that behaves like it belongs to a higher dimension. And I think that happens on, on DMT, where, for example, you can enter a room where it's not only that the walls are tessellated with uh, beautiful wallpaper symmetry groups, but also they're in a state of uh, coherence. So that, for example, the wallpaper symmetry group in one of the walls, whenever it spins in one direction, the equivalent wallpaper symmetry group in another wall spins in the opposite direction at the same speed or something like that. So that kind of um, interrelated patterns um, can generate collectively a virtual higher dimension. And I mean, in that sense, I think, yeah, we have barely scratched the surface of what kind of phenomenal space, uh, spaces can exist out there. But I, I would, yeah, essentially make the, <laughs> make the claim that we can expand the dimensionality, we can make it hyperbolic, we can actually change the global topology. This happens on high doses of DMT where, for example, um, your representation of your eye may reconnect, <laughs> kind of a magnetic reconnection with uh, your feet. And all of a sudden you have kind of this crazy circle that goes from your eye to your feet and travels through your body. And like you're connected in this very, very weird way that is very exotic. And okay, that would be kind of a global topology change. So yeah, in a sense, like the particular phenomenal space that we are experiencing right now is really just kind of like a very, very basic um, special case of really the state space of possible phenomenal spaces, which is like much, much larger. I guess it would be interesting to find the constraints of that uh, possible space, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, I mean, it's not going to be infinite. I mean, like the, the most general it could be uh, is not, not really the most general, but like one way to think about like just how general it could be is to essentially think of it as um, space and the metric of space being emergent out of a graph. And so if you essentially have like what we call it, like, you know, a planner, regular graph, like a lattice graph, um, and you can like walk from one node to, to other nodes, essentially the number of nodes that you can access as a function of the number of steps that you make will grow, let's say, quadratically if it's in two dimensions, or will grow like, you know, cubically if it is in three dimensions. But if you start to add, you know, random connections in the graph, <laughs> at some point you turn it into a small world. And then, yeah, the the amount of uh, nodes that you can access with each step grows exponentially. So that is kind of like by adding extra extra edges, you turned you know the metric of that space from something that was Euclidean into something that now is uh, hyperbolic. So you're kind of modulating space properties by adding edges in this context. But I mean, with that, with if you actually have kind of a graph as the you know the underlying mathematical object, 
the amount of and qualities of spaces that you can generate is extraordinarily general where like you can just <laughs> you can you know wrap it around you you can connect it you can um, you can segment it you can make it two dimensional in one region and three dimensional in a different region you can make it hyperbolic over here and you know elliptical over here essentially yeah the world is <laughs> is yours in that context um but i don't know if you know phenomenal space is actually implemented with a with a graph and I, I suspect it's probably implemented with a different mathematical object um but ultimately yeah if we find like strong constraints it's like okay no under no drug and under no meditation or no technology it's all it's impossible to create a client bottle let's say <laughs> um like maybe it is possible to create a projective plane or you know a, a spherical space or something but client bottles are just not possible yeah that would actually suggest that you know, it's not as general as a graph, that maybe there's like more constraints than that. And I don't know. I mean, my experience so far is that it's much more general than we realize. And every time I've thought of like, okay, there's this constraint that cannot be overcome. <laughs> In practice, a new experience comes <laughs> that shows that, oh, oh gosh, like actually that was possible after all. Yeah, I guess that's the weird aspect of it that you can just keep expanding that's like keep finding new terrain in that space and yeah okay thank you very much for that answer it, I, i'd love to keep talking about it but like there's still other people and uh, yeah, yeah. The, do you want the reward question or uh maybe, uh, maybe let's, maybe let's move, move on. on just to yeah all right no yeah. Uh, but thanks thank you so much Les. yeah you can you can leave it in the question channel okay yeah. anyone else can also okay uh stay silver let's invite him Yes. Uh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So um, I had this question about um, the gathering empirical evidence for the QRI paradigm. I also posted this in the in the question channel. So basically, like it seems to me like. Um, the QRI worldview actually makes a bunch of predictions on things that we have data already. And I think it could be really useful um, to like convince skeptics, and especially thinking about let's say this wrong cluster. Um, and I had these like one of the ideas was like the symmetry theory of valence should predict that um, harmony in music is like intrinsically pleasurable. So um, like Westerners generally prefer harmonic chords, and the theory would predict that um, that this preference is at least partially innate and not entirely culturally conditioned. And you could actually look at studies that looked at infants' uh, responses to chords or something um, to test that. And then another idea was um, about about visual illusions. Like if if digital computers do not don't solve binding, then we should expect that they don't exhibit Gestalt, like the gestalt of closure. Um, so by, you could just look at um, papers where they're tested, but or not like neural networks um, have gestalt phenomena. Um, so yeah, those were two of the examples where I think like you, there's actually already data out there that, that could provide evidence for or against um, the like your eye paradigm. I was wondering if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, the article that, yeah, became kind of this uh, sprawling mess of uh, essentially writing about the symmetry theory of valence for academic publication, essentially, yeah, was uh, gathering all of the evidence that exists already. And I think, like, there's just so much. I mean, like, from, uh, yeah, essentially uh, harmonic patterns on Janus, on EEGs, to essentially, yeah, innate uh, cross-cultural preferences for harmony. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why a lot of people love to point out. I think it's kind of a postmodern um, ethos, <laughs> point out, like, well, you know, such and such culture really likes this harmony. But no, I mean, if, if you actually, yeah, look at the studies in general, that that's going to be kind of the m hardcore music aficionados, but like, yeah, not in everyday life. <laughs> most people at most ages in most places, essentially, yeah, just prefer things that are not dissonant, that, that it is a, a pretty universal pattern. Um, and also like visual preferences, like the ki the, there's like studies on like what kind of fractal dimensionality people prefer. And it, it really does seem to be the case that there's like, yeah, strong effect sizes there. Um, might explain to some extent like why people enjoy nature. 
Uh, I mean, what the symmetry theory of valence would have to say there is that, yeah, I mean, essentially a fractal layout in your visual field may actually be a way of minimizing the strain that your visual field is experiencing because of, yeah, the, the cross-scale resonance that is going on there, uh, essentially being able to spread out uh, the stress in a more even way across the entire visual field. Um, which is, yeah, to say that I think, like, empirically, there's, like, already a lot of evidence that can be put put together uh and we're yeah essentially in the process of of of, of making that a uh, review article um what was the second question i think the other example was um like the gestalt law of closure oh yeah, yeah, yeah. triangle like is i think your theory should predict that it doesn't appear in neural networks so um... not really i mean like you can create a neural network that is like a, a gestalt detector i mean it's not gonna have i mean it might have like require a slightly different architecture. But I, I, I mean, I'm definitely not saying that it is impossible <laughs> to detect no, but, the gestalts. Um, yeah. It wouldn't appear naturally, that's what I meant. Like you wouldn't automatically have it like as an inevitable side product of just regular that's right. processing. Yeah, it's, it's not an inevitable side, side product. I mean, I think like adversarial, um, all this research on like adversarial images that convince a convolutional neural network that this is a dog, you know, but it's actually, <laughs> it's actually, you know, like, a tiger or it's a car or something, but it just has like a little kind of like stenographic modifications that make it look like a dog for the particular neural network. I mean, to some extent, yes, kind of, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty stark uh, demonstration that, okay, the neural network is not binding in the same way that a, that a human can. But even just looking at the architecture, I mean, um, I think like not with the more recent, you know, not with transformers, but with the kind of like classic, um, convolutional neural network architectures for modeling uh, visual data, um, I think just by looking at the architecture, you can make the case that it's clearly not you know, creating a unified bound representation that is coherent across the scales. Why? Because it usually has this layer that is the you know, dropout layer, <laughs> um, where essentially you just look at, um, the, oh no, sorry, the max pool, the max pool layer, which is like the, the parts of the network that essentially look at um, if the convolutional filter got activated, you just look at where it got activated the most, and then you just propagate to the next layers that value. But you're actually losing information about where it is. And I mean, that's why, yeah, you know, uh, Mr. Potato from uh, Toy Story, where like maybe you can have the uh, eye in a different location and the, the nose in a different location. If your convolutional neural network is not sophisticated enough, yeah, it can look at a Mr. Potato and think it's a it's a face. It's a normal face because it detects, oh, there's like an eye and there's a there's a nose and they're both present in this region, but they're not like properly wired. And like it's not actually capable of perceiving that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think I guess to wrap up, like just looking at the architecture, you can conclude that there isn't actually any kind of globally coherent internal bound representation uh, because of things such as the max pool layer. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting argument. And what was the article you said where you already looked at this stuff? Uh, so, the, so we haven't published it. It's uh, like our review of the symmetry theory of valence. I mean, it's one of the things that we hope to put out in uh, as an academic publication. Okay. But it's, it's in the works, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. OK. So next one, Clarity. I'm going to invite you. Okay. Yes, I think. Uh, yes. Nina, Nina, thank you so much for doing this. So, let me direct this out so that I can just. Okay, so my question is what's your take on the possible research value or perspectives afforded by highly negative variables theory, especially those outside of the machines? Maybe speak close to the microphone. Yeah. So my mind goes to e.g. Josie Kuhn's total throwing up of hands for an explanation of Salvia's characteristic machine scape phenomenon. Of course, the notion of inducing such qualia is quite fraught, mm -hmm. uh, but setting the practicality, et cetera, aside, could there be insight in sufficiently pure or refined or one-pointed highly negative valence experiences? 
I mean, on a, on a practical level, I mean, essentially, the, the most useful thing there, I think, is from the point of view of how do you generate equanimity, given that kind of uh, experience? I mean, you know, Shenzhen Young would argue that, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true, right? But like, if you ask him about like, okay, look, how do you deal with intense suffering? He'll mm -hmm. just give you the standard response of, if you can approach that intense suffering with enough clarity, concentration, <laughs> and equanimity, uh, it's actually going to purify you. Okay, like, that's, I think, like, kind of a cruel thing to say to somebody who's, you know, unfortunately having intense suffering um, and may not have been, like, doing a lot of equanimity practice beforehand or, you know, being committed in that way. Um, but, I mean, to the extent that equanimity might be a general solution to suffering, I think that's where I would be, I would find that, like, really interesting and valuable. Is especially, okay, like, you were in that state of consciousness, were you able to access equanimity? If not, why? And if yes, why? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but but I mean, it's like I guess like to be to be explicit about it, like QRI does not intend to induce uh, negative states of consciousness and study them. You know, yeah, I think like sure. the 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 big priority is a finding pra pragmatic, very um, uh, simple solutions for 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 suffering, and then modeling, especially the other very high valence states of consciousness. Um, so yeah, no, no, no research program to create a salvia health spaces. <laughs> yeah, for but, sure. but yeah, I mean, if uh, if uh, if they can shed light on how to achieve equanimity, that that will be super valuable. Yeah, sort of a hyperbolic time chamber for equanimity practice. Cool. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, <laughs> and thank you for your uh, trip report. Really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> so let's hold him off. I'm going to invite you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hello? Hello. Yes, can hear you. Yeah. One moment, folks. I think my... Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you are. Oh, we can hear you. you. My audio just died at the wrong moment. This is, oh, no. this is such a problem. <laughs> oh, <no. But laughs> would oh, you no. mind uh, and then I'll sort out my audio and come back to me? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Bernie, I'm going to take a super quick bio break. I'll be back in, in one minute. Okay, yeah, sure. So that, that's if you both want to take a break, oh, sure. Or actually, wait a moment. I understand Am I... you correctly, Andres. Did I understand you correctly? Did you, did you say, Andres, you also want audio break? Maybe yes. <laughs> Maybe that's why he doesn't respond, because he's also taking audio break. Okay. Yeah, hopefully you can all sort it out. Or hopefully I'm not confusing it. I just want to interject again real quick. This is amazing. It's really high quality questions from all of you. Thank you yeah, for yeah, participating. Hopefully in the future we can hold similar events like this. Definitely. <laughs> we could make this like a week or monthly thing or something like that. Weekly or month. Weekly maybe not. Monthly or by by yearly or something like that. Okay. Hmm. Does anyone if anyone wants to say anything? Oh uh Hello. Uh, is my is my audio working now? Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Can you hear us? I can hear you all. Yes. Thank you for being patient, and thank you for doing this, Andres. Um, I had a, a pretty practical... Hey, oh, um... wait, 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 wait. He also took a break. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, I'm back. <laughs> no worries. Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much for doing this Q&A. Um, I, I had a pretty practical research question. Um, I know that uh, kind of QRI's core paradigm um, includes a lot of focus on um, like replicators and replicating behavior in dynamic systems and you know, ultimately seeks to ground consciousness in uh, the very complicated dynamic system that, you know, we experience as, as physics. Um, but I'm kind of, uh, as somebody who's interested in, like, game of life and cellular automata, I'm interested if QRI has kind of done any work trying to build even from that kind of low-level primitives of uh, behaviors of certain, you know, highly compressing or highly causally uh, clustered uh, pockets of uh, game of life or other sorts of uh, cellular automata. Um, 
if that research has been done, I'm curious what the results are. And if it hasn't been done, I'm curious if there was kind of practical blockers there uh, or um, just kind of what the state of the field is uh, in that area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, in the video on solving the, the phenomenal binding problem that you can find on my channel on YouTube, I address as kind of like one of the hypotheses for how the binding problem might be solved um, in terms of the cellular automata dynamics. And, you know, some people might look at a glider. <laughs> I know Scry definitely believes this. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> but yeah, that uh, essentially like a glider kind of like has a, <laughs> has a unified uh, nature, you know, kind of like it's a thing. It has kind of like some kind of well-defined boundaries. But yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that's uh, essentially a, a projection that is like, no, actually the thing that is bound is your consciousness. <laughs> And your consciousness has yeah patterns of local binding, so it can cluster things in your visual field. And you look at a glider and like, okay, that behaves functionally as a unit, but uh, objectively, yeah, no, the cylinder of Tamara is just this grid. And just because yeah, there's like this tiny corner of it that you know has kind of a self-replicating pattern that doesn't naturally generate a you know a true boundary at the bottom level, um, and and definitely not the sort of boundaries, the sort of meaningful boundaries that we think uh, are necessary to solve the, the binding problem. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean that uh, cellular automata cannot shed you know light on on a lot of questions. And I actually think like one of the most promising areas of research in AI is essentially neural cellular automata, where essentially the thing that you're exploring is the space of possible rules, cellular automata rule sets that it essentially um, it's kind of like rather than, okay, let's take the, you know, Conway's game of life and create a computer there is more, let's uh, explore possible rules for a cellular automata until we get something that is like much more uh, capable of instantiating a computer. And I mean, essentially, I think like a lot of the things that I talk about in uh, the nonlinear wave computing uh, video and things in that paradigm can have very powerful analogs in the, non, in, in the neural cellular automata paradigm. I mean, and, and in some sense, neural cellular automata may actually be a source of potential uh, philosophical zombies in the future. Actually, things that may have some qualia-like behavior, I mean, without actually being bound, but may behave like it to some extent. Uh, why? Because you can, you know, by exploring the set of possible cellular automata rules, you're also exploring the set of possible nonlinear wave dynamics. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you can essentially approximate the behavior of, you know, cornstarch in water. <laughs> you know, like when you push it, it becomes harder and, and has like these strange resonant modes if you put it on a speaker. Uh, you guys should definitely watch a YouTube video of that. It's really, really trippy. Uh, I think, yeah, that can essentially be approximated with a neural cellular automata. I'm sure you can also approximate the you know, the behavior of water or the behavior of mercury and other things like that. Um, so yeah, extremely, extremely promising. Uh, I'll just point out that I, I don't think it can solve the binding problem. <laughs> so, so we're not going to actually have like, yeah, consciousness from that, but yeah, extremely yeah. promising uh, area for, for AI. Thank you for that answer. Um, could I give a, one concrete example uh, and just kind of get your, get your thoughts on that? Uh, um... I, I'm sure. curious. There's a, there's a there's a area of research that I've been looking at, and and I think somebody posted like one article about this on Less Wrong, and then it got no attention. I'm really confused why, but they were looking at um, like uh, patterns uh, that you know, if you were to instantiate this pattern in one particular spot in an otherwise random uh, game of life grid, uh, in in you know in in all possible game of life grids that have that pattern at that location, like the ultimate. Uh, uh, behavior of that system is like highly determined by that one space. They were kind of thinking about this like, if you were to put a super intelligence in a little corner of a game of flip grid with the mission <laughs> of uh, turning the entire rest of the grid into a smiley face, right? If you could really do that, then a high percentage of the grids that had that pattern in it would ultimately end up being a smiley face. Um, and I wonder if that kind of, that sort of behavior, even if it did not have the sort of phenomenological binding that would make it consciousness, if that would be something that you would kind of fit into like the replicator versus consciousness uh, uh -oh. distinction some, somehow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think there's a gazillion different ways in which we can have uh, zombie AIs uh, essentially take over the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, whether it's, yeah, yeah, gray goo or um, some kind of like, yeah, larger scale, uh, you know, mining all of the 
matter in uh, Venus or or, uh, or Mercury in order to create a Dyson sphere, but with no consciousness. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those scenarios are like possible. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers because, but yeah, uh, it's a very interesting thought experiment. Um, there's also like, I guess, in this space, like there are like patterns in cellular automata that cannot arise unless you start the word with them. And uh, that's also kind of like a very interesting thing that we may be shielded from, yeah, some things in reality simply because, you know, that particular pattern actually isn't present already and it cannot be bootstrap. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer, Andres. <laughs> Okay, so let's invite Smogblock. Uh, I'm gonna invite him. Yes. Can me? Yes. yes, hello. Okay, yeah, I have a very short question and you can answer it however you like. Um, my question is, who are you? Mm. Who am I? <laughs> um, <laughs> usually, yeah, I mean, usually I represent myself as um, a guy uh, in his early 30s uh, obsessed with philosophy and consciousness, uh, writing weird articles about psychedelics online. I think like that's probably a very big <laughs> chunk of my self-representation. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think like probably, yeah, the more you know deeply transformative experiences that I've had you know, have evolved some some degree of uh, ego death in one form or another. So I do have like very present that uh, if I meditate in the right way or, you know, we have the, the right kind of con conversation, you will spark in me, yeah, this very strong internal feeling that I am consciousness itself or that I'm pure consciousness. Um, oftentimes, yeah, I might also fall into the empty individualist attractor, not, not in the sense of believing in it, but in the sense of like slightly experiencing it that way, uh, which at times can be kind of disconcerting. And <laughs> I actually, is not one of the things that I enjoy the most, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that definitely happens. Um, I think, uh, yeah, probably I'm kind of an outlier in the sense of um, taking consciousness seriously. And then on top of that, trying to describe it like structurally. Uh, and, you know, that kind of like rare quality is probably also pretty central to my internal representation. Um, and yeah, I guess like finally, yeah, I'm, I'm hyper philosophical. I, I just, you know, from an early age, um, it's very hard to focus on normal everyday tasks without, yeah, getting derailed by thinking about reality and consciousness and, <laughs> and who I am. And I think that definitely is part of a, a big part of my internal representation. Uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, the, the meme of uh, somebody at a party, everybody's dancing and, you know, they're <laughs> somebody's like sitting right there. You're thinking like, oh, they don't know. They don't know these. Yeah, in my case, it would be something like, oh, they don't know. You can use um, topology to solve the boundary problem or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, hopefully that answers your question. I don't like the book. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Let's let's maybe read one question from the questions channel. It's by Sol, sure. and he's he's asking. Uh, oh no, I don't know how to read it, this name. It's Arkanihamets Amplituhedron. Theory states that neither physical space or physical time are fundamental, but rather arise from the symmetries of the amplitudehedron. <laughs> Do you think a similar approach could be taken for the fundamental space? Maybe for the qualia state spaces? Right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what I was uh, explaining. I forget uh, the, the name I was explaining it to, but yeah, that essentially the standard kind of 3D you know, projective Euclidean space that we know, uh, the phenomenal space that we experience is, yeah, just a super special, you know, corner case of all possible phenomenal spaces. And yeah, I mean, like the, the states that you access on 5MEO DMT, for example, um, they distort phenomenal space so dramatically. I mean, when you achieve like such a degree of symmetry uh, and smooth geometry, essentially, yeah, you collapse either into a point or or not even that, you know, kind of, um, where space doesn't even make sense because everything is essentially connected so intensely that it's just functionally kind of like just one point. <laughs> so yeah, I think you can collapse the space. You can do all sorts of crazy things. I'm not sure if, yeah, uh, the am amplitude hedron, if I'm saying it correctly, uh, will be the right explanation space, but I, I think it's worth uh, thinking about this. Okay. 
and another one is from Isomorphous. He says, uh, does QRI believe that dissociative identity disorder is a patho pathological form of topological segmentation, similar to Kastrup? If so, are there any plans to study that, study that from the QRI field of view? Uh, similarly, does QRI agree with Penrose, Hemeroff, or Katstrup that anesthesia is an important is important to the study of consciousness? Mm. Yeah, yeah. To answer both, um, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I all, all sorts of kind of uh, multiple identity disorders. I I do suspect they involve essentially. Like some kind of an unfortunate uh, introduction of a global boundary uh, internally. So, like, usually we have a lot of internal boundaries, and yeah, I mean, we kind of like have dissociated selves. I mean, in some sense, when you're talking to somebody and representing them, it's kind of like a weird thing because you're representing an entire avatar with you know a lot of internal complexity, a lot of internal states that you're simulating, um, but is you know cleanly di dissociated from your sense of self. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, already we, <laughs> all of us already have like multiple personality disorder, we just don't realize it that, you know, just by the mere fact of representing somebody else, you kind of like have like multiple selves inside you. Um, and, you know, from a certain point of view, you could argue that, um, you don't need any kind of like crazy, you know, global boundary to explain multiple personality disorder. You can just explain it in terms of, uh, something like there's like, multiple senses of self within the same globally bound experience. Uh, and I think like that, you know, might account for a good percentage of like phenomenology. But then there is like also very, very strange things that happen on multiple personality disorders that actually to me do suggest that there is like a global boundary and there's actually, you know, on any given moment of time, there might actually be like uh, multiple streams of consciousness going on in, in that brain. And I mean, the sort of thing that makes me think that is uh, multiple anecdotes of people with multiple personality disorder essentially uh, having dreams where um, each of the identities actually experience the dream from a different point of view. And kind of like if they all attended a party, it's kind of like, oh, you know, person A was in this corner, person B was in this other corner, and they were seeing each other and interacting and, you know, they have complementary information and... Um, they were actually, they were not actually experiencing the same thing and they can, you know, each of the identities will report like different points of view from the same experience. Um, and then the other thing too is um, uh, huge uh, memory gaps that essentially when you're not the, the right identity, you, you may actually have like no access to, to information experienced by the other identities. Um, and then like the struggle that happens uh, for them to take control uh, very weird, you know, muscle movements and uh, facial expressions that at least intuitively suggest that there's, yeah, some kind of a struggle for for <laughs> acquiring control of, yeah, essentially like motor outputs. And um, I think like if, if it does turn out to be that uh, there is a, you know, global boundary in the topology, um, diagnosing it and identifying where that is happening might also allow us to generate new therapeutics to actually, you know, cure it. So that you may, for example, aim the tra a transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, specifically to the region of the brain where the, you know, collapse happened, the collapse of dimensionality, the pinch point that is dividing the, the topology, and maybe, you know, reinflate it or re-anneal it in such a way that you actually dissolve that internal boundary. And yeah, that might be a way of like reintegrating. So I think like understanding it would, yeah, ultimately also allow us to, to generate like therapeutics for it. Um, you know, QRI doesn't have that many resources and we already have a lot of, uh, yeah, other projects that are taking priority. So I, I don't actually expect us to study multiple personality disorder formally or empirically anytime soon, but we are very interested and extremely open to essentially publishing like high quality phenomenology of it. So if anybody listening to this essentially has anybody they know or you, you yourself suffer from multiple personality disorder, uh, I highly recommend you read our guide for um, r reporting about exotic states of consciousness and essentially writing like a true report <laughs> of what it feels like to, to have this disorder. And that I think would be extremely valuable. 
Definitely. I would also add, uh, how do you conceptualize like schizophrenia or psychosis? Could it be like too many construction waves or too many deconstruction waves or not enough of those or ecumenity waves and so on? Yeah, schizophrenia, I don't have like a super detailed model of it, but I, I, I'm pretty convinced that it involves uh, kind of a disorder of dissonance where, I mean, like, yeah, people with schizophrenia, if you ask them about their phenomenology, yeah, it seems like things are sometimes um, essentially not synced up properly. There's kind of gr a sense of inner grinding, a sense of uh, inner shearing. A lot of things that to me suggest, yeah, some sort of like dissonance disorder. And yeah, I mean, whenever you experience hard to explain uh, negative valence, oftentimes you end up, yeah, projecting it towards like, for example, the avatars of your internal world simulation, or you need to kind of uh, push that energy and dissonance elsewhere and try to make sense of it. And so you may, in a sense, like push it towards hallucinations. And uh, I do... One ex one example. So, like, um, of all of the drugs out there, um, there is a a couple that actually are protective against uh, schizophrenia or uh, psychosis in particular. Um, you know, you can look at some. I forget, like something like seventy or eighty percent of people with schizophrenia smoke tobacco or like vape, uh, take nicotine essentially. That cholinergics seem to essentially help with the clarity of thinking and, and reduce the, the negative valence of hallucinations. But then the other, maybe somewhat surprising for some people, it might be that, you know, if you're a, a methamphetamine addict, uh, your risk of psychosis grows way up, you know, and if you're a psychedelic user, also your risk of psychosis increases, you know, not as much as methamphetamine, but it will increase cannabis. Also, for sure, you increase your risk of psychosis. But opioids, <laughs> opioids are actually protective. Uh, I remember reading a study about tracking kind of the base rate of psychotic events in opioid addicts, and it actually seems to be lower than baseline. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, my suspicion is that the best way to treat uh, schizophrenia will actually be with something like anti-tolerance drugs with opioids. <laughs> uh, yeah, and probably a lot of people wouldn't like to hear this, but but yeah, I mean, like it, that might actually help reduce the internal dissonance uh, that they're experiencing and if it doesn't treat the hallucinations at least they're not going to be you know unpleasant hunting <laughs> terrible hallucinations nice that, that could, could be studied uh, scientifically in, in a controlled trials and so, so on definitely okay uh let's invite scry and thank you for the answer that was very good invite. yeah yes We cannot Hello? hear you. Hmm. Oh yeah, wait. Okay. Ah. <laughs> yes, that was very loud. He's probably setting it up. Let's let's see. Okay, let's let's maybe uh put you in a queue. If you will fix it in a, in a few seconds, then maybe not. Let's invite, for example, Son of Soul. Uh, invite to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, so like, I've read somewhere that uh, David Pierce um, believes that the pleasure pain access can only be accessed by like um, biological systems. So, like, if um, if a quantum computer ever became conscious, it wouldn't be able to experience uh, pleasure and pain. Um, I'm not sure if I'm like remembering that correctly, but that's what I remember. Um, and like similarly, um, I think you just said that um, that uh, like certain types of qualia, like color, for example, um, um, would like depend on the kind of protein structures within the brain, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, I guess my question is, um, do you think a uh, a general consciousness system is possible like in like by general i mean like a consciousness a, a a conscious system that can um in theory explore any region of the state space of con uh, state space of consciousness yeah i don't know if that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah not totally i mean like that is uh, what we call a full spectrum super sentient super intelligence <laughs> essentially yes like a 
<laughs> this, you know, hypothetical entity that essentially would be capable of exploring arbitrary state spaces of consciousness at our, you know, whatever is like physically realizable, but probably enormous levels of energy and intensity and vividness. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's the sort of uh, super intelligence I think would be potentially actually good to construct as opposed to like a zombie zombie AI. <laughs> um, I, I will clarify that uh, I don't remember seeing David Pierce saying that a quantum computer wouldn't be able to suffer. I think he does hypothesize that there is a biochemical signature of bliss and he thinks, you know, it might be in the pleasure centers, the particular protein structure involved there. The perspective at QRI there is different. I mean, essentially, we think of valence as a much more kind of universal property of arbitrary conscious experiences. And that valence has actually to do with the actual binding patterns. In, and it's not... So that's kind of like why they distinguish between uh, whether like, you know, phenomenal space, which is like a binding kind of qualia, is something that emerges out of like the local binding connections versus something like phenomenal color, which you can think of as kind of like paint, a uh, particular quality that you use to, to paint the walls of your inner world simulation, as it were. Uh, I think David Pierce thinks of um, pleasure as kind of like that, you know, kind of like color, the color red or something like that. There's also the, the hue of pleasure, hedonic tone. Uh, whereas at QRI, we actually think of uh, valence in a, in a way that is way closer to how we think of phenomenal space or how we think of uh, phenomenal time, which is a this emerging property of the structure of the wiring of, of the local binding connections. And so, you know, the actual shape of phenomenal space uh, determines the valence ultimately. And so, you know, a lot of like unpleasant experiences have to do with, you know, jagged or sheared or disjointed phenomenal space or phenomenal time that is out of tune and, and things like that. And in that sense, I, I suspect that, yeah, probably making artificial consciousness, you know, recruiting the electromagnetic field, um, probably, you know, getting to make like valence experiences wouldn't be that difficult. Um, and yeah, for sure, like I think uh, a quantum computer could definitely have a have valence if uh, if you program it right. Um, I think it's a very important open and open question, like how present valence is, you know, outside of biological systems. And I think I'm, I'm really undecided. I mean, I think there's really kind of like two plausible plausible options. Number one, that valence uh, it's only really kind of like concentrated in uh, conscious experiences uh, like ours from, you know, that evolved because it's playing this computational role. So in some sense, like the nervous system is kind of like refining and purifying and concentrating this valence quality because it's useful in it. Um, whereas let's say like the qualia of a quasar or, or a black hole or something like that is kind of this elemental qualia that really has like no reason to have valence uh, one way or the other. So it will default to kind of like this noisy, close to zero valence structure. But there's also an alternative view, which is that, you know, valence really has a lot to do with, for example, the degree of entropy or neg entropy of a system. Then any kind of like system that actually is, uh, you know, has like this, you know, in Freestone's terms, um, non-steady state equilibrium <laughs> that follows, you know, the free energy principle, for example, the crazy topological pockets in the sun, you know, that the trap, these like plasma tubes and things like that, then those maybe would actually have very heavy valence. Uh, why? Because the, the ability that they have to survive may actually have to do with how well they can harness symmetry internally, how much they can shed entropy to the environment and essentially keep a low, low entropy configuration internally. Um, and I'm very undecided. I'm, I would assign more probability to that most of the universe is neutral in valence, but I'm quite open to the possibility that actually, you know, most of the valence has nothing to do with biological life. And like maybe relative to the pleasure or suffering that, you know, the pockets in the electromagnetic field of the sun uh, are like, we are nothing, you know, we might be just a rounding error relative to like, yeah, the, the big stuff that is going on out there. Uh, yeah, open to both possibilities. Thank you, thank you.
Okay. Let's invite Kavicha. Uh, I'm scared that I I destroyed everyone's name here with my pronunciations. <laughs> okay. Uh, we cannot hear you. Oh, I forgot about Scry. <laughs> so I'm gonna oh, invite sorry, him again. <laughs> yeah, and first first Scry, and then 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 you. Okay. So if your mic doesn't work, you can fix it meanwhile. Okay. We cannot hear you again, Scry. Maybe it it broke again. You mean? Okay, now we can hear. You. Yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay, so yeah, my my question is um, in regards to uh, phenomenal binding and the topological uh, segmentation. Basically, you did um, on on Twitter. You'd mentioned that you do see discrete systems as being capable of binding. So uh, my question would be like, what about what would be the simplest case of that, uh, of, of kind of like two bits of, um, you know, zero, one, one, or one, zero, I don't know if that would necessarily model difference. Um, yeah, how would, how would two binary bits be bound together? Um, I'm not, I don't really remember where I said that discrete systems can bind, but I mean, maybe, maybe I can uh, elaborate a little bit on, I mean, where, where I do think this can happen. So yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the hypergraph, the, the, uh, the Ruliad. Um, oh, sure, sure, sure. This model. Hmm. So, I mean, essentially it depends, it depends on what is your starting ontology. So, I mean, essentially if you're starting ontology for how you, you know, formalize the universe is something like a cellular automata on a graph, then I don't think you can actually bootstrap, yeah, essentially like objective frame invariant causally significant boundaries out of that. Um, and in that sense, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to actually have like bound experiences. But if you, you have like a mathematical object that is more general, such as, you know, I guess like Wolfram's rule yet, which, you know, Josh Abach is a very big fan of. I think, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, I actually think of it as like, yeah, something that is compatible with Quilia formalism in that like you're actually using a mathematical object that is richer than just a graph. And because you have like a richer, in this case, a hypergraph, um, you do have, you know, the capacity to have um, bound systems that actually have like objective and frame invariant and costly significant boundaries, namely, whatever a hyper edge is able to connect. And so whatever a hyper edge is connecting, you, you know, could, could postulate, and obviously depends on the actual precise rules of the, of the cellular automata. Um, but it could actually have, yeah, essentially the right properties where, you know, it's, it's generating um, a holistic behavior that can be recruited for information processing. And you could imagine that, yeah, if you have like a rule yet with a, with a hypergraph, um, and uh, you let it evolve for a very long time, eventually evolution will be kind of recruiting the rules of like when a hyper edge arises in order to process information, you know, and may create a kind of like a brain structure that has <laughs> a very high density of hyper edges. And, you know, that ends up actually processing information more efficiently. Yeah, that might actually be the signature of phenomenal binding in, in that case. The, the kind of like beautiful thing about this is that, uh, and now I remember what, what I meant by a uh, discrete in this case, is that each moment of experience would have a discrete amount of information in that you can say precisely, you know, what is the information content of this experience? Because it's fully captured by, let's say, what is the structure of the graph that is connected by this hyper edge? And yeah, in that sense, you could order, you know, all possible experiences from least to most complex, <laughs> for example. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's going to be a discrete number of them. And there's probably going to be a largest possible experience, which is like, what is the, you know, physically realizable largest hyper edge that you could possibly have given this rule set? Um, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, as, as it's a, it's a tough question to answer and it's still probably an open question too. <laughs> um, 
I'll also, uh, I'll just let you know, I, I definitely am going to work on trying to make a uh, steel man argument as to why gliders might be real. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, but I, I think there's some, some arguments I can make. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. I look forward to your article. That's, uh, yeah, the sort of thing, I mean, like this sort of, uh, you know, a spin-off content from from QRI. Like, if anybody listening, obviously, you know, there's so, something I say you <laughs> you think doesn't make sense, or uh, you can find a counterexample or counterargument. Of course, like write a blog post. I, I I would, you know, at this stage, I would actually be quite likely to to respond to it <laughs> on a blog post or something like that if you guys agree. Because yeah, I mean, the meme plus meme plex is really only kind of a uh, starting to grow now, and like I, I definitely have the ability to respond to that. Eventually, I'm sure like there's going to be enough responses that I actually want to be able to. But but right now, yes, I open invitation to all of you to write blog posts and articles about uh, all of this content. That would be fast, very very helpful. Okay, so let's for example invite yourself. <laughs> invite <laughs> yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I forgot. Uh, let me just put it in queue because Kavicha fixed her or his problem. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, oh, here's great. Well, yeah, Mac. Mac has like really weird uh, preference of whether you can allow your microphone to work or not. So, okay, got that fixed. Great. Um, hi. This has been like a very interesting Q and A. Andreas, um, I'm the uh, public universal sock from Twitter. I think we've chatted for a bit. Um, you tweeted about a few weeks ago about, um, like deriving political fury from, uh, the first principles of consciousness, which is like a really interesting idea for me. Uh, I'm, I'm trained in like game theory and neoclassical microeconomics, which are, uh, it, it's an interesting framework, but very limited. And I was wondering what would you think would be the building blocks of this, uh, political fury based on consciousness? <laughs> oh my goodness. No, I mean, this is a fascinating topic. And um, I mean, I think like, yeah, politics might be one, you know, cause for the world to destroy itself. So actually getting it right would be really, really useful. Uh, but it's an extremely tough problem, I think. And uh, also it's kind of like a, you know, a minefield. There's like things I could say that, you know, not, not, not that it would be like that big of a problem. The, the main problem would be like wasting time if somebody gets offended by something I say and... I end up, you know, wasting a bunch of time defending myself or something like that, which is why, yeah, generally, as a general rule and policy, I, you know, I don't talk about politics. I don't talk about specific policies that are controversial in general. Uh, maybe a few exceptions, for example, about, you know, decriminalizing psychedelics or something like that. But yeah, now in general, I, I don't touch it because I think it's too dangerous and, and very much of a waste of time and energy and effort. So um but I think like talking at the level of a uh, meta politics uh, can can be quite fruitful um, and, and helpful and ultimately necessary when you want to actually solve coordination problems. Um, the first thing that I will say is that uh, the game theoretical angle, in some sense, uh, might already kind of like assume that uh, people are not willing to, in a sense, cooperate for the greater good. Uh, which is, of course, absolutely essential to model. But, I mean, essentially in the ideal scenario, how things will work out will not be just, you know, whatever game theory says is going to be the rational, selfish choice for each actor. But it's going to be something more interesting, which is we achieve some kind of meta-rationality, such as identifying with consciousness itself. And then we realize that, you know, maybe the only winning move is not to play, <laughs> in which case, okay, we don't need to waste all of these resources by going to the defect, the defect region of the, you know, game theoretical game board. But, you know, we can apply something like super rationality and actually both cooperate by default. And um, yeah, I mean, essentially we think that such as uh, the optimistic view where, you know, MDMA states of consciousness actually are, you know, not only feel good, but actually make better organizations, um, then, yeah, essentially, cooperate, cooperate dynamics might actually, uh, <laughs> you know, bootstrap into a completely new paradigm that, you know, we're not constrained by game theory because we actually can 
you know, cooperating independent of it. Um, I will also add that, uh, I mean, I think um, understanding that uh, we have to generalize our conception of self and sub-agents is, is very critical in that usually the unit of rationality is thought of as the individual. But individuals are multitudes. Uh, uh, yourself, maybe you want to mute, mute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're, yeah, okay. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, essentially we're multitudes. So you could imagine like an alternative uh, society where like everybody has multiple personality disorder, <laughs> like everybody. And it could still be a functional society, but imagine the game theory and imagine the politics of that. <laughs> Or imagine a society where like everybody is an open individualist. Like, okay, like the, the politics and game theory would be very different. The, the current situation is going to be even crazier because we have an ecosystem of senses of self. Yeah, we have like some people that are enlightened. Most people have kind of normal, standard, everyday sense of self. You have some people with multiple personality disorder. You have some people who have tulpas. You have some people who have like LSD sub-agents that they constructed uh, when they were on, on psychedelics. Uh, you know, we have like a very crazy ecosystem of like the actual wiring of all of the internal sub-agents and whether they're cooperating or not. Um, and yeah, my my suspicion is like the, the actual best politics that will benefit everybody and consciousness will involve some kind of like change of our perception of our sense of self where, yeah, we identify with consciousness as opposed to, yeah, we're our particular genes or our particular patterns. And the hope um, is that, you know, we can construct such a thing as like team consciousness, essentially uh, benevolent sub-agents that we cultivate inside us and with each other that actually are essentially, yeah, bidding for the well-being of consciousness itself. And ideally, we will identify ways in which that is uh, politically advantageous, in which that is functionally and computationally advantageous, so that, you know, it's actually... Um, you know, belonging to team consciousness is actually a way of winning. And and I think that's actually quite plausible. Why? Be because if you're part of team consciousness, you're actually not that afraid about changing your state of consciousness uh, because you don't identify with your particular, you know, everyday life sense of self. And if you have that, then you have access to a vastly expanded, you know, computational space. So I would expect that, yeah, I mean, team consciousness will probably be much more capable of super cooperation and much more capable of super intelligence. And that gives it a, a leg up. <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of a, the ideal hope, you know, future politics is going to be open individualist politics and it's going to be a very different paradigm. Thank you, Andres. That was super interesting. Just, uh, yeah, great. You're welcome. Uh, who's next? Bernie? Yourself. Yeah, okay, yes, yes. yes. Uh, yourself is next. Hey, uh, yes. Uh, yourself here. So, my question is about the symmetry theory of valence. So, um, it's not clear to me intuitively that there is such a thing as a canonical measure of how symmetric something is or what is more symmetric. Like, suppose we take a square and a regular pentagon. Uh, the regular pentagon has a larger, say, rotational symmetry group. But if you include the mirror symmetries, then the square is more symmetric. So there seems to be some arbitrariness in choice as to like which symmetries do you count? What is more symmetric than what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean, this is a huge topic. I mean, and I would say like a very active. Um, area of research and there's like a lot of open-ended questions but I would say there's like ways of uh, constraining the problem where like you do have um, a precise you know measure of symmetry that arises and of course like yeah the, the question is like which of these measures matter I mean one I think one important hint is that the symmetries that matter at least when it comes to uh, valence and states of consciousness are essentially the symmetries um, that engage active transformations. So uh, so essentially, if there is a flow of energy in the system, um, the way in which the energy flows um, is the kind is um, 
the transformations where symmetry matters. So um, the way I, I ground this is uh, with, yeah, Klein's uh, account of geometry in terms of symmetry. Uh, I have like this like excerpt from a um, complex analysis book in qualia computing, which is uh, uh, Geometry According to Felix Klein. I think it's the title of it. And essentially is this account that there is like this very, very deep duality between a smooth geometry and symmetry groups. Um, and yeah, I mean, phenomenologically, essentially, when you are in a very high valence states of consciousness, you have smooth geometry. Uh, the, in, you know, the intuition pump here would be this uh, excerpt from seeing that freeze that is called uh, high valence meditation on qualia computing, where Rob Rubia essentially talks about how, yeah, like more blissful states of consciousness involve uh, fewer blockages and you know, fewer pinch points and discontinuities. And if you introspect on the way the energy travels in your quote-unquote energy body, <laughs> again, like not, not making any metaphysical claim here, but just phenomenologically, um, essentially when you have a very smooth energy body, the waves of energy travel without dissipating energy. Okay, so essentially the, the more, the larger the region of your experiential field contains a pocket that is geometrically smooth, then the more symmetrical your experience as a whole is. And that cashes out in terms of whether there's energy dissipation or loss of energy when waves of energy travel in that pocket. So one kind of like holistic proxy for what is the amount of symmetry in the entirety of the, of the experience would be yeah, how much uh, energy dissipation there is. I mean, essentially, if you have a perfectly symmetrical experience, um, the waves of energies, as they travel throughout you, essentially will be lossless. They're not going to lose any energy at all. And, you know, if you're in a, a JANA or 5MEO DMT experience, you, this sometimes happens. You kind of like become a um, almost kind of like completely, completely uh, uh, close. Well, one metaphor I use is kind of a, uh, you know, like a Christmas ball uh, in, in the Christmas tree has kind of this reflective su surface inside it. Um, if it has a tiny hole and you put a LED inside, well, all of the light can escape through that hole. But eventually, if you actually cover the entire thing, you get kind of this like spike of energy because the energy can't leave. Essentially, the light continues to bounce inside it. So yeah, when you achieve like a really, really high valence state of consciousness, that phenomenon that happens where like the energy doesn't have anywhere to go. I mean, essentially because the geometry is so smooth, energy doesn't dissipate. So I think that is kind of like a very promising global um, kind of like account of energy because it's not only, okay, how many, uh, you, you know, symmetrical transformations it has, but it's also how many symmetrical transformation it has relative to the transformations that are going on. And the transformations that are going on essentially is energy flow. And therefore, <laughs> when you have like very smooth space, energy flow is very efficient. There's no energy dissipation. And as a consequence, how much energy dissipation there is might be a really good proxy for how symmetrical the state of consciousness is. Uh, ho hopefully right. this... So it, it's an interesting answer. So what you're saying is energy dissipation, which is like a single real number, could be a good proxy for valence. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Do you believe that this could be in some sense fundamental or do we need a more complex structure to really characterize valence? Like you could, uh, you've written before about like fast, slow and spiritual uh, euphoria, right? Yeah. So it's not clear also from my internal experience that you can assign a real number or even a total ordering on like valence do you think that what what kind of structure do you think is fundamentally uh, needed to describe valence and can we put a total ordering on the, or that or is that yeah not even i mean i i think we can and uh i mean like to revisit that um fast uh euphoria being like the things that you experience on stimulants or when you're really pumped up um slow euphoria kind of like opioids and you know alcohol and things like that spiritual euphoria you know, meditation and psychedelics. You know, nowadays I would give it a different name, <laughs> which is actually, you know, fast euphoria corresponds to 
high frequency consonants. So like if you if you take a stimulant, I mean essentially you will experience some kind of a um essentially like a, a gridlock matrix of uh vibrations at higher frequencies that is very consonant and kind of like works as this frame that enhances working memory and motivation and you know okay, a bunch of stuff. But it is, I think, like fundamentally predicated on like how efficient energy transmission is in the high frequencies. Then, you know, slow euphoria, I think, is consonance a harmony in the low frequencies. And in this picture, you know, spiritual euphoria, psychedelic euphoria is consonance of a fractal kind, meaning that there is consonance across the entire spectrum that you can essentially, you know, when you have kind of these fractal pictures, like you look at a tree and it fractalizes, is the same leaf, except that rotated and translated and minimized, you know, scaled <laughs> and projected. Yeah, I mean, what you're doing there is is uh, creating like a, a resonant interlock between things that exist at different scale, right? Like uh, the leaf that is closer to you, like the large leaf, is in resonance with this other tiny leaf over there. They're all part of the same fractal structure. So that would be cross-frequency coherence and cross-frequency consonance. So I think it still cashes out into hey, how efficient is the energy transmission <laughs> across the board? All right, that's very interesting. Um, I wonder if your introspective experiences matches that, that you can actually like assign a real number to uh, like your states of consciousness and say, well, this definitely feels more pleasant <laughs> than yes. this other state. Does? Yeah, yeah, it, okay. it does, it does. And I mean, in the... I mean, I, I do think that, uh, okay, the final kind of like valence score, it, it is meaningful, but it is like losing a, a bunch of information. And the, the kind of like the, the compression that I'm the most comfortable with, that I can say like, ah, yes, this captures my experience and is agrees with uh, STV, is the, um, this diagram that I put on the, the article Quantifying Bliss, where essentially it's kind of this tree force, <laughs> you know, the, from the Zelda, <laughs> because is like essentially a three complementary spectra, which is, okay, the spectra of consonants is like, how is consonance distributed across the, the, the frequency range? Do you have like low frequency consonants, high frequency consonants, et cetera? Then you have the dissonance spectra as well. And then you have the noise spectra. So that is the CDNS, you know, the consonance, dissonance, noise signature. And that compression I'm very comfortable with. I mean, I can be meditating and I can tell you, yeah, right now I'm experiencing a little bit of, a, you know, medium frequency dissonance because I have a little bit of joint pain in my knee. And like, yeah, it is that kind of negative valence. It's like it has that frequency and it's, um, it's dissonant in this particular way. Or I'm experiencing low frequency consonance because the waves of energy are traveling without losing energy across my entire body in this like very nice slow vibration. So I think yeah, you can faithfully characterize it that way. And when we organize, um, you know, hopefully soon, <laughs> like you know, uh, rigorous above board psychedelic retreats for physicists, mathematicians, you know, visual artists, and so on. Uh, one of the things that essentially, yeah, we will train people to report is going to be the CDNS of their experience so that, you know, they can fill out a questionnaire and say like, okay, how much are they experiencing high frequency dissonance right now of different forms and, and so on. And I think, yeah, that, that faithfully captures what matters about a person's valence, essentially. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I could talk about this more, but I don't want to keep up, uh, keep too much space uh, occupied. So... <laughs> Uh, thank you for answering and yeah. we'll talk later you, you can put Thanks in some stuff in the question channel or you can uh, if there will be time in the end you can come back so yeah okay, okay. I'm yeah. gonna now answer from one who is in the voice chat but cannot speak let me just quickly get it hopefully you can hear me because I had to move for the first third time <laughs> uh, to a different place anyway uh, I'm gonna find it real quick here it is. Okay. Is there a particular outlet to contact about offering experiences with consciousness and participating in the way that we described? Uh, should it be this Discord server, a direct email or such or some kind of 
or some other method of communication and i would say definitely this discord server on the there's this trip report um, um, channel or there's this meditation channel where you can essentially put any experience that you want and uh, talk about it with any, any, everyone here essentially but uh, for example clarity made this trip report and she sent it to andres and he sent and talk with it about andres and it uh, it was posted on his blog so that's also one way also one idea is this rational uh, psychonauts subreddit uh, so that's also one possible thing, way that I can think of. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just to reiterate, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can guarantee that I'll, I'll re like if you post a trip report on the Discord server, um, on the appropriate channel, I, I will read it. Uh, you know, I'm still kind of like getting used to like interacting with the Discord on, on, on a regular basis. But yeah, that definitely I will read it. If you send it to me via email. Um, I will most likely read it. I mean, like, you know, I mean, I, I will read it, but like, if I'm very busy, I might not respond because I get a lot of emails, obviously. But, um, but I do, I do like really pay attention to like trip reports and meditation reports that I, that I get because some of them are like really awesome. And when they're awesome, I, I generally post them on quality computing. Um, I also definitely encourage people to use, uh, yeah, psychonaut, rational psychonaut, um, in Reddit, the subreddit. If you, if you post it there, I mean, I would appreciate it. This is just kind of to, to grow the meme plex. <laughs> I would appreciate it if, for example, you add references to, hey, I'm, I'm using the framework um, for how to do a, a high quality trip report from QRI. And here's their link to, you know, guide to writing high quality trip reports about exotic states of consciousness. So, I mean, essentially, yeah, kind of um, connecting this meme plex to, to that community, I think, is going to be very helpful. Um, because, yeah, I think like a lot of the trip reports that people post there can definitely be improved with some of these frameworks. So I would appreciate, yeah, kind of links to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, I, I think like we are on the kind of on the threshold of having like a culture of people who can actually yeah report scientifically useful and meaningful properties of their experiences on a much larger scale, which of course, yeah, right now it's <laughs> just a handful of people, but I think it's going to grow. So I'm very optimistic. Okay. Uh, okay, we can take one more from the questions channel. Is that if every experience corresponds to some mathematical object, what about the converse? Does uh, the monster group have a corresponding qualia? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I don't think so. And essentially, I think that um, realized mathematical objects is probably a very tiny subset of all possible mathematical objects. and. Why? Well, this will take us to, yeah, the crazy philosophy of uh, zero ontology. That, like, you know, for something to exist, <laughs> it has to satisfy this constraint that, in a strange way, it cannot generate information. That, in some sense, like, the one constant that is, like, always true is that there is zero information in aggregate. And so, like, not all physics, you know, has that property. I mean, in fact, like, only, for example, the uh, decoherence paradigm in quantum mechanics like actually preserves zero information. Whereas, if you have the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, every time you measure a quantum system, you're introducing information out of the blue. So, I mean, essentially, the the physics that are compatible with zero information is not all of mathematics; only a subset of them. And but maybe you know, maybe every you know. Um, physical model of a universe that is mathematical and guarantees zero information actually gets realized because of model realism or something like that. That, 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 that may be possible. So if the monster group is actually embedded in some, you know, physical theory that preserves zero information, yeah, maybe the monster group exists out there as an experience. So thanks for that, sir. That's pretty nice. <laughs> Let's... Let's invite Edu Premi Remix. Invite to speak. Maybe he's not here. Okay. <laughs> Let's invite. Okay, he's here. Nice. Um. Hello. Are you here? Are you there? Maybe. Uh, Mike. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. 
Okay, great. Um, apologies if there's a lot of background noise. So the question is a bit off topic for the specific URI stuff, but it's, you know, vaguely in the sphere of interest, I suppose. I'm curious, Andres, what are your thoughts on the current state of rejuvenation medical technology? What do you think are the key players in there? Um, what do you think has changed in the last five, ten years? Maybe especially with regards to private funding going in that kind of sphere? Maybe the general awareness of the public? How do you see the next few decades in that regard? Maybe some general comments would be interesting. Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't followed closely. I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of like yeah, essentially treating aging as an a disease. I mean, I think that's the the correct frame. Um, I, obviously, I'm kind of a transhumanist at heart uh, in in that sense. Uh, and I think yeah, I mean, it's essentially super longevity. I think it's a really important goal and altruistic as well. It's not. I don't think it's selfish to want to get people to have like longer health spans. I think that's yeah, very, very laudable laudable goal. And um but I I don't know kind of like what are the details on the ground of like, you know, what is happening out there. Um I do think that essentially I mean like okay, like there's probably gonna be all kinds of problems when it comes to the economy in the near future because of yeah the war and things like that. But um in the next decades though I do anticipate a big economic boom essentially derived from like much better biotechnology uh i think that's gonna be very surprising to a lot of people just like the the economic impact essentially this, this is gonna have uh generally like very very positive um and yeah i mean the the technologies of like yeah i mean essentially crispr uh cas9 i think is like extremely powerful gene drives but i don't i don't know the details of like what's actually happening in the ground i i think like one aesthetic i mean definitely work that uh Mike Johnson has talked about is um um kind of like reducing mutational load as a possible approach, and I think like yeah, that might be also a very very promising way of increasing general health, even without like knowing exactly <laughs> what you're doing. Just by reducing mutational load, you might be able to like yeah, massively increase that. Uh, wonder if there's anything else I can say. No, I think that's about it. I'm I'm not like super informed on on what's going on. Yeah, I think Mike has mentioned also, as a somewhat near-term thing maybe, organs grown outside of the body uh, used for transplant, like as healthier versions of themselves for relatively wealthy people, maybe in the next 10 years or so. Yeah, we're calling it mentioning that. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you essentially grow, let's say, a liver <laughs> or a kidney. Uh, using your genes, but essentially um, you get rid of the mutational load. And then you, yeah, you have kind of like a super clean, amazing kidney <laughs> that is, you know, kind of a transhumanist kidney in a way. Uh, and yeah, even though it's just your kidney, it might be enough of an injection of negentropy into the entire system that all of a sudden it also fixes a bunch of other things. Yeah, that's a very optimistic, but I think it's it's plausible. I think out of the three categories of super happiness, super intelligence, and super longevity, you consider super happiness to be by far the least funded, the least uh, um, popular, let's say, at this time. Would you say yeah. that's accurate? I mean, I think, I think there's like just such a powerful case for investing in super happiness. I mean, like from, <laughs> I, I can just like build super quickly. I mean, first of all, enormous low hanging fruit. I mean, like, essentially very few people like actually studying it so it is like neglected for sure i think like definitely to some extent because people are not willing to you know <laughs> say out loud that okay their objective is super happiness instead yeah something much more tame like getting rid of depression or something like that but i mean even then i think like there's not a lot of innovation and there could be just so much more um then also that yeah it is uh, obviously significant and uh i think it is tractable i mean precisely in the sort of like work that we we do at QRI, um, but but on top of that, I mean, I think of working on. I mean, a lot of people say it now. They say, say these these days. Sorry, uh, which is like working on plain capabilities AI is maybe not the best because in some sense you you might just be accelerating like a you know takeover by artificial 
intelligence. Um, whereas I think like, yeah, working on super happiness, essentially it, it is going to align humans. It is actually giving us um, a skin in the game. There's a reason to be alive. Uh, it kind of like aligns our values uh, adequately. Uh, and also it is like intrinsically motivating. Like the moment you actually do have kind of tastes of super happiness, it's like, okay, this is, this is something <clears throat> I can wake up in the morning for. Uh, it's, it's something to, to actually look forward to, um, a reason to actually solve the problems. And, uh, and also a lot of, I think, like the you know, risks that we, we have uh, come from people who are yeah, essentially nihilistic or depressed or they have a vengeance or revenge psychology or things like that. And I mean, essentially, yeah, kind of uh, MDMA-like technologies will, I think, like tackle all of that, uh, improving mental health is one way of reducing X and S risks in, in general. So I think like that's um, put, puts it to me as kind of like one of the reasons why to prioritize it on top of, you know, super intelligence or even super longevity. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Uh, yourself mm -hmm. is still here. Do we should probably... Yeah, there's yeah, uh, one no, last Just guy. a comment that maybe yeah. we should close it in uh, 20 minutes or so. Yeah. I'm happy to keep chatting for a bit. But... So sounds about right. <laughs> okay. Uh, do do we I'm going to invite him. I think, and with him, I think that's everyone who had their hands up, which is good. Uh, when not counting those that had to leave. Okay. So, are you here, Dwini? Andres. Hey. hey. Can you hear me? It's, yes. it's Honey Bear. Honey Bear, uh, rings a bell. Anyway. Yes. yes. Oh, don't worry about it. Um, anyway, um, so the points you made about open individualist politics, and um, I think is, you know, there's a lot there. But I also think um, one of the biggest things you could do, um, or we could do generally to increase well being. Um, is just in creating the context for people to be consistent enough with meditation so that they can experience states like super happiness where they will be motivated um, to propagate those states of consciousness, not only in themselves, but others. And I, and I, think, um, I think that's a large part of the, that solves a large part of the problem of suffering individually, but also uh, on, on the macro scale. So. My question is, is this, has QRI thought about this at all? Because mm -hmm. uh, we talked about neurotechnologies. Um, you know, the, there are many ways you could think about that, but the motivation to actually practice consistently um, and, and why many people fail, I think solving that problem could do a lot. Yeah. Um, that yeah. Go ahead. No, I think, I think that's a piece of the puzzle. I mean, like, oh. definitely. Yeah, cons you know, pra uh, meditation hygiene. Uh, oh, if you if you mind uh, uh, muting uh, while I, while I, I think there's a little bit of feedback. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, practice hygiene. I think like that's probably yeah, pretty pretty important. I mean, th definitely like some large effect sizes. I mean, definitely for my personal life. Whenever I I do like you know very consistent loving kindness meditation, for sure my well being increases. <laughs> I become yeah friendlier and, uh, and more effective in general. I think. Um, uh, I think we have to take into account that like, okay, like some percentage of people would enter dark night of the soul. Um, they will need a lot of like support. Um, potentially, you know, there might be like a big kind of like hurdle or like uncanny valley where, yeah, if you get enough people to, to meditate, but you don't have the adequate support structure, the total amount of productivity may actually go down simply because of the amount of time and energy that happy to be dedicated to helping people who are experiencing dark nights. So I think it's like, yeah, definitely some, some complications. And in, this may not be the case with every kind of meditation or every kind of uh, practice or yeah, meditation hygiene as, as it were. Um, but uh, I don't think that's like, yeah, as kind of like revolutionary or transformative as like, you know, accelerating the process of achieving something like, you know, stream entry or fourth path. Uh, I think that, yeah, that, if you can accelerate that by, you know, 10, tenfold or a hundredfold, we're, we're talking about a completely different game all of a sudden. And that's why, yeah, I mean, I think 
I would assign kind of the, the bulk of the probability mass of what's going to be m more transformative uh, to be like, yeah, developing technology to accelerate it as opposed to culture or like an app or a system to guarantee meditation hygiene. N not to say that we shouldn't, you know, put energy into it, but it's just like from a, you know, effective altruism or effective consciousness research point of view, um, I, I would say there's probably a stronger case to be made about like acceleration as opposed to just consistency. Um, so maybe this is just based on the um, limitation of the experiences that I've had, um, but don't you think there's something about the actual process, uh, the discipline sitting down and practicing consistently that, um, you know, is transformative in a way that merely having the experience wouldn't be? Um, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think that's definitely a part of it. But there are, I mean, there's no shortage of people who simply do not get benefits from meditation, even though they may meditate like, you know, one hour, two hours a day for 10 years, and they still don't get anything out of it. So like, there, there's definitely, you know, and you could say like, okay, their discipline is probably helping their lives a little bit. But, you know, relative to somebody who actually gets like a lot of progress pretty early on, I think... That's, yeah, probably much more transformative rather than just the, the sheer discipline uh, cultivation that is going on. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so we're going to invite Arglas. Uh, invite to speak. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, let me see. Um, my... Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a difference between oh uh having a theory that our data can't rule out and having a theory that we can give a, a good positive argument for uh could you say no you're you're welcome to answer my question elsewhere like in a thread someplace but my question is what is a good positive argument for the symmetry theory of valence i uh, i grant that if we want a successful theory it has to do x y and z but i'm concerned that even even bad theories that are false can also do x y or z so so what what like why i guess why is the symmetry theory of value uh, uh, symmetry theory of valence true and that'll that's my question i'll take my answer off the air so to speak <laughs> i mean i i think i i think i make a very strong case in the presentation i gave in 2020 uh i mean you can look up in quality computing symmetry theory of valence 2020 presentation which i gave to the uh yeah, Imperial College uh, Psychedelic Club uh, with Robin Carhart Harris. I think I think that's uh, very compelling. I mean, it, it is exactly the sort of thing that like it's integrative and it's consistent across many different disciplines and many different projections, uh, and makes predictions that so far seem to be true. I mean, for example, yeah, the it's very strange that in EEG of the Janus, why would you get like seizure like uh, patterns that have harmonic structure as opposed to like seizure like patterns that don't have harmonic structure. Like that is like really surprising and very difficult to make sense of uh, otherwise, I would claim. Um, and also, you know, like if you use STV as kind of like a guide for, for meditation, like you, you will essentially sh see that um, many things that could falsify STV uh, simply don't arise. So for example, if you're meditating and you notice that there's a particular blockage um, in one region of your body or, or region of your mind, STV would say, hey, if you can smooth out that blockage to the extent that waves of attention can go through it without getting blocked or, or slowed down, that that's going to make you feel better. <laughs> and if you meditate in the right way and you make that happen, you realize, yes, actually, this does feel better. So, um, I mean, I, from the point of view where I stand, I think I've seen the theory from enough points of view and considered alternatives that I think the, the case is really strong. So I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, I don't think it would fall in the category where we just can't rule it out. I mean, 
I think quite the opposite. That there's like a lot of things that it suggests should happen, and then when you do verify, they do happen. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, okay, gonna invite Alex six zero nine. Invite to speak. Yes. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. So thanks for doing this, Andres and Bernie and everyone who's here. I just wanted to say that, you know, it's a really interesting conversation. And, you know, at the risk of maybe sounding a little bit naive, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, imagine if we do develop like a super happiness pill. Do you think that would like end all wars or is that <laughs> that's, you know, basically like intrinsically coded into human nature and it's something that you can't really escape as long as, you know, there's limited resources in the un the universe? Yeah, uh, I don't think super happiness will automatically end all wars, but it would go a long way in that direction. Um, in general, I think like, you know, the, the reason, okay, like, I, I think like it's important to do this sort of research um, with uh, values such as like caring about all sentient beings is because essentially there's many ways of achieving super happiness. And I think like the the one that I'm the most interested in is precisely one that also essentially instantiates like pro-sociality, caring about other sentient beings and empathy, compassion, <laughs> and so on. Which is kind of a special case of uh, super happiness. I mean, if you make the analogy with uh, substances, uh, you know, cocaine and, and methamphetamine tend to make people very uh, selfish, self-centered, withdrawn, like obsessed with their own reward. Whereas, yeah, something like an MDMA-like state of consciousness can be just as pleasant, if not more, but also makes you really concerned about others and wants to, yeah, essentially harmonize your representations with that of uh, other avatars in your <laughs> in your world simulation. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, like amphetamines have been used in wars, even though like briefly makes you makes you more euphoric. Um, but MDMA hasn't been used in wars, and I don't think you can really use MDMA to, you know, enhance the soldiers or something like that. <laughs> um, well, you can use it to cure their PTSD after the fact, which, okay, there's maybe some game theoretical considerations there. But, uh, you know, as a, as a general rule, I think focusing specifically on the sort of super happiness technologies that also make you care about other sentient beings is the way to go. And that kind of uh, technology, especially if they provide this uh, positive feedback loop where people who are in those prosocial states of consciousness can cooperate with each other, in a way that gives rise to higher performance, then, you know, that due to evolutionary selection pressures, that is going to be favored. And that is kind of yeah, the other, the world that I'm banking on, <laughs> where essentially we create super happiness technologies that makes us actually more productive and, and better at interacting with other people who are also more pro-social and more, more productive. And, and that, I think, does have the potential to end all wars in, in the long term. I mean, essentially um, creating entirely, yeah, novel systems of um, politics and governments that essentially, yeah, have consciousness as the primary value. And I think, yeah, in the long term, that's honestly our only way out of, uh, yeah, just pure replicator <laughs> dynamics, uh, as I see it. I see. Okay. And so I guess one other quick question is like, you know, I know you said you were thinking about like hiring engineers, but is there any like, projects that you guys have that's kind of like open source software related stuff that people could just contribute if they have some time to yeah that it's i'm very open to that i mean like right now it would be uh the the, the main bottleneck there would be like management and you know quality control um and there's like some possible issues concerning like intellectual property so like for example um i wouldn't quite open source like um let's say like, you know, harmony, harmony quantification in sound, because there's like a lot of like possible, essentially like, yeah, like for-profit spin-offs that might be able to fund QRI in the long term and, you know, be part of the positive feedback loop <laughs> that makes this sustainable. Um, but there's like other things that I think like open sourcing them would make a lot of sense. And one project that 
uh, we're very likely going to just open source is essentially uh, this like texture analysis uh, system. So essentially one of the, yeah, really exciting projects that I'm, yeah, very, would be very proud of if we can actually pull that off is essentially a way of visualizing um, tactile patterns. This has um, a very, very amazing positive externality, which is that it might be kind of a core technology that could be used for improving medical diagnosis. So essentially, imagine you go to the doctor, uh, you're experiencing some kind of pain, rather than the doctor asking you, hey, is this like sharp pain or shooting pain or dull pain and all of these words that like, you don't really know what they mean. <laughs> if instead they show you an iPad that has, let's say like 10 kind of like little GIFs of like kind of like little dynamics, you know, some of them are kind of a sprinkly and other ones are kind of these uh, uh, look like Conway's game of life or like, you know, slightly different dynamics. And like they ask you, okay, what, what does your pain or tactile sensation resembles the most out of these pictures? And then you select one of them and then it shows you a menu of like 10 new ones, which are kind of like variations on the one you selected for. And then you do these again, like, you know, three or four times until you find like a picture that, okay, like that is the dynamic that shows, you know, describes my, my tactile sensations. And, you know, it may turn out like, okay, that's like the kind of pain that is reported more by people who have a tumor as opposed to people who have a, uh, you know, like a herniated disc or something like that. You might be able to distinguish between different, you know, diseases that have similar phenomenology. People describe it similarly, but well, have similar descriptions, but actually have like very different phenomenology once you visualize it. Okay, so that project <laughs> is one that I, I do look forward to essentially like open sourcing it and yeah, essentially opening it up for people to play with it and contribute data. Um, and yeah, that might be a, a, a way in which an engineer not, you know, hired by QRI might be able to, to contribute. All right. Yeah, that sounds super awesome. Okay, hopefully I can uh, contribute. Uh, you know, whatever I can in the future. Awesome. And and yes, of course, if, if people have a um, experience with product management in the software side uh, and, you know, kind of like can take the role of managing a team of volunteers contributing to an open source uh, project, you know, that would be, that would be amazing as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so let's invite Friar. If he's here or he, I think she, it's she. Not responding. Three R. Yeah. No. Okay. Possibly not responding. Okay, let's invite an XO. Invite to speak. Okay. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I would like to ask you, Andres, um, um, like shared experiences, like how do you look at this? Like, uh, let's say in terms of like topological segmentation, like if you have like two persons or even a group, like do you do you see basically any merging of any of those topological constructs? <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I mean, like, like just if you're, for example, living with someone, like you're kind of going through some experiences together and there's like some resonances even between two sentient beings. But even if you go in a rave, I think this is kind of more clear that there's more to it. So I'm interested in your thoughts here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I somewhat answered this question before, but uh, uh, maybe as, I mean, it's essentially the same answer, but compressed in a slightly different angle is that um, absolutely the topological account would have a lot to say about like, you know, strange resonances and interconnections between people. And there would be essentially kind of like a, a whole hierarchy of qualitatively different kinds of connections between people. Uh, I was uh, saying how, yeah, I mean, like topological properties of the field are robust against perturbations. You know, you can stretch it, you can deform it, but, you know, as long as you don't undo the knot in the precise way, you know, you're going to continue to have the, the, the knot. And so like, yeah, when you're like very deeply connected with somebody at an emotional level, maybe you're actually creating a knot in the electromagnetic field that is, uh, you know, entangling you with that person in, in some very deep way, um, which might account for like, okay, why when your grandmother dies, you're able to, <laughs> to, 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 to say that, even though, you know, you shouldn't know that. Um, 
and and yeah, there would be kind of like this hierarchy of different qualitatively different kinds of connections where if you can imagine, yeah, soap bubbles, they can either like touch at one point or they can touch at a line or they can touch at an entire face or they can even like break that entire face and all of a sudden it become the exact same pocket or like undoing the pinch point as it were. And yeah, I mean, like some of the most insane trip reports that I've read are precisely those that involve, for example, high dose LSD on a group setting where everybody says, yeah, and then we became one. <laughs> and like, we, we all have like memories of having become one. <laughs> and it was really strange and very trippy. Well, yeah, maybe that would be kind of like, you're actually undoing the, you know, the pinch point in, in the topology and, and actually creating a shared pocket. Uh, I think it's unlikely. Again, I mean, I think it's much more likely that what you're doing is dissolving internal boundaries through a process of increasing impedance, matching and energy that gives rise to annealing and synchronization between the avatars inside your world simulation. And that gets rid of internal boundaries and that, you know, within your world simulation, you're undoing the, 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 the internal boundaries. But um, I'm open to the possibility that, you know, it's actually happening at a deeper level. Amazing, thank you. And uh, yeah, just one more quick, uh, quick one. Uh, when can I expect your next video? And uh, which <laughs> topic are you working on now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, video. Well, I, I do plan on making uh, one video this week. So hopefully by the by the next weekend, there's gonna be another video. And uh, I haven't decided on the topic. I mean, essentially they have like a a backlog. I mean, like there's um uh three videos that I have planned. Uh, on kind of like a series about the future of consciousness. Uh, essentially, one video about uh, reducing negative extremes, one about like increasing baseline, one about achieving new heights. Then I also have like one planned about philosophy of mathematics <laughs> and the phenomenology of mathematics. You know, what is it like to solve a very difficult mathematical puzzle or something like that? What are we doing? What is the computation actually going on? Um, and yeah, then also, <laughs> if, I, if I become brave enough to do it, I might actually uh, make a comedy special <laughs> just, just for laugh. Well, also to introspect on the, on, on the you know, phenomenology of humor, which I really like, obviously. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to try again, invite awesome. Friar, because she didn't right. know yeah, how to... Yeah, I think just to... maybe the... Last yeah. question or, or next it's, to last? It's the last, last per person, person who, who had their hands up, uh, who hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, okay. okay. Can you hear Hello. Yes. Can you hear me this time? Yes, yes. It works now. Yes. Hi. Okay. So I have, I think, two questions. Um, my first question is that I am a hospice nurse, so I am very professionally and personally involved and interested in ending suffering. And I want to know, though, do you think that there is any value in suffering? So that's my first question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very briefly, I think uh, there's a lot of reasons why we would want it to have value, meaning that it's one way of coping with it. Um, I do think that in many cases, uh, personal development is gated by suffering, that essentially in many cases, we only truly grow or kind of like mature our personality when there's actually a very difficult challenge that really asks us to kind of like up our game and become a better person. Um, but if I were to kind of like make a guess, you know, what percentage of the world's suffering is doing that, I would say it's probably a tiny percentage, maybe, you know, 2%, 5% of suffering is meaningful in that sense. Whereas, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think like the the bulk of suffering is is pretty pointless. I mean, it's, yeah, things such as like somebody who's like 80 years old and is like on dialysis and, and dying a very horrible, horrible, day. like that's the sort of thing that, yeah, like we, we should end that because it has really no purpose. Thank you. It makes me wonder, you know, we should maybe think about this stuff before we make that universal happiness pill, quantify how much suffering is actually useful so that we don't eliminate the useful suffering um yeah, and then yeah, my I'll, other I'll add that, yeah. sorry sorry <laughs> not to interrupt I'll, I'll add that um so i mean also yeah the concept of equifinality that like and generally speaking yes it's possible that right now given our psychology personal development is gated by suffering but i'm actually very optimistic that you know something like mdma like consciousness 
would also actually accelerate personal development. And like my simple argument is as follows, which is that most personal development actually has to do with overcoming the biases of your ego <laughs> that we have, you know, most people have like an ego. Some people have very strong egos. And um, yeah, when essentially your life circumstances go against the desires of your ego or your self-image, sometimes, yeah, you have to kind of like painfully modify it. But on MDMA, you have like this very strong sense of self with total self-honesty. So my suspicion is that, yeah, personal development can actually be drastically accelerated and actually in a loving way without any suffering involved. I like that a lot. And then my other question is just sort of, I don't know, um, more social. Um, I had one time reached out to the folks at QRI just to ask them like, hey, was there any job opportunities for someone like a, like me, like a nurse who's interested in doing some research for you guys? Um, and I had a very nice back and forth with the interns, um, Anders and Maggie. I don't know if you know them personally, but they yeah, seem yeah. lovely. Yes. <laughs> and they actually reached back out to me to ask me, why are there so few women interested in QRI? And mm -hmm. I haven't responded to them, but I, I thought, here I am. I have this opportunity to chat with you. And I have noticed, and I'm sure probably everyone else in the chat has noticed, the gendered breakdown of who is asking questions and who's participating in this chat. And I wonder, what is, what is your take on the gender breakdown um, and the participation and the, the hiring structure at QRI? And why is it so skewed towards people who identify as male? Yeah, it's a good, a really good question. I mean, there's a, a lot of things that can be said. Um, I think uh, in terms of base rates, I mean, like if you look at a, you know, math departments, engineering departments, um, things like that, you will generally find that, okay, like there's like a general tendency towards people who have like very high Asperger's quotient, kind of systematizing mindset. And that does have like a pretty significant, uh, yeah, kind of like gender skew. Um, yeah, I mean, not, not to get into, yeah, too politically controversial things, but like, it, it, you know, if you read Scott Alexander, he makes like really compelling case that essentially, um, gender differences in professions and interests, interests actually increase the more egalitarian the society is, because essentially people are um, more capable of pursuing their innate interests. And in general, uh, you will have that, yeah, essentially kind of like a more masculine way of thinking um, is like more kind of like interesting objects as opposed in things as opposed to people. Now, in, in principle, though, the work that we do at QRI should also interest anybody who's interested in people. And I think like, one of the things that distinguishes us from, you know, the rationalist community is that, yeah, we actually have like a much more enriched and expanded conception of what intelligence is. That, you know, we don't think of intelligence in terms of IQ, although I think, you know, IQ obviously matters quite a bit, but also, you know, like introspective capacity, philosophical intelligence and empathetic understanding. I mean, definitely... Um, empathy is enormously cognitively demanding and it's not just a personality factor. It's actually a lot of crazy <laughs> computation is going on. Um, and to that extent, yeah, I would expect there to be, yeah, some like more women than in the rationalist community in particular. Um, and I think like, yeah, the, the, the gender breakdown in that sense is not as skewed as like in a community like that. Um, I would think that the demographic is more similar to effective altruism, which is still like like more male um, skewed, but not as much as the rationalists. And yeah, I mean, I guess to kind of open up about that, I, I, I do think, for example, um, uh, exploring state spaces of, of consciousness is definitely something that shouldn't, in principle, have like any gender, gender skew. And one of the reasons why I kind of like became interested in, in uh, scents, like exploring the smells is... Partly because, yeah, that's kind of like open to everybody. And in my experience, um, something like 80% of people who I know who have like really good kind of vocabulary for scents and describing smells are women. They, there's kind of like a little bit of an um, uh, orientation um, towards kind of like the, the fine qualities of, 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 of smell that like is more interesting for women for whatever reason. Um, so anyway, it's not... The, the gender skew is definitely not for a lack of effort to kind of like, yeah, essentially bring people with all kinds of uh, qualia into the, into the mix. But I think it's important to be somewhat realistic about how if you have like a field that is 
very kind of like mathematical and very focused on systematization. Um, it might appeal more to, yeah, essentially people with higher Asperger's quotients. And as a consequence, there will be a little bit of a gender skew. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it. And I hope you find ways to open up the tent and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe someday we'll be colleagues. Nice to chat with you. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, we can wrap it here then. Uh, I'm going to clear the questions in the questions channel so that there are only questions essentially. So if you want anyone else, you can post a question there. And maybe if Andres wants, he can like answer it there or anyone else from QRI essentially. So that's one possibility. And um, yeah, uh, maybe if, if some people want, we, we can move to a, to a classical voice chat to like to have a chat and so on. That's also if you want to. And may, that's maybe all I wanted to say. Perfect. Do you want to say something, Andres? <laughs> Oh yeah, well, I mean, this this has been fantastic. Uh, amazing questions. Uh, very grateful for the community and amazing turnout. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Round up of, of applause for everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I really uh, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, this was recorded. Uh, so, the recording will be I don't know maybe it could be uploaded to somewhere QRI YouTube channel, for example. I don't know whatever S somewhere on YouTube on some channel. Uh, so that's also one thing and uh, perfect I think that's it then All right. yeah so yeah well I infinite bliss everybody yes. I'm gonna go for a for a run <laughs> but yeah <laughs> nice. take care everybody thank you so much yes agree <laughs> okay see ya bye bye <laughs>